All right. Well, Hello. good evening, everybody. This Peace is uh, William Bell, and with me is Mr. Martin, Martin Henderson. Yes, sir. And also Elvin Israel Israel. So uh, we're here tonight, just going to have a little fireside chat, so to speak. Uh, we're going to talk about covenant eschatology and uh, versus cosmic eschatology and, you know, maybe a few other topics just for a few minutes, not to spend a, a long time tonight. Um, at any rate, uh, Martin is here all the way from California. California, yes, sir. Man, isn't that awesome? That is awesome. All right, picked him up a few hours ago, and uh, we went out and had dinner. And looking forward to hang, right. hanging out with him food. on tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we'll be in the radio station uh, tomorrow. Don't miss that at nine o'clock Central Time. And uh, and then after that, we'll be heading to service. I'm sure. Sorry. Okay. I'm sure. <laughs> All right. So um, we're uh, we're ready to go, and uh, so let's get started here. Okay. Now, uh, what is covenant eschatology? Covenant eschatology is uh, first of all, let's break down the two words. Of course, you got covenant, and so that means that you're dealing with the change or the transformation from the old covenant which is in the scripture the realm of the flesh to the realm of the spirit mm -hmm. and this is a covenantal change it's not a cosmic change in the sense that it refers to the material world most people are under the impression that eschatology is all about a uh, cosmic change from one world like the physical world in which we now live which many of them have a paradigm that that uh, world is or this world is going to be uh, destroyed uh, and that we're going to be jettisoned from the earth raptured from the earth etc and go to a new world or a different world and so that's what their uh, covenant eschatology is centered around but in the bible eschatology is focused on the transition from the covenants from the covenant of the flesh which the bible calls the flesh and it doesn't mean by saying flesh that it's speaking of your um physical body or something to that effect it's actually talking about your stance before god the covenant that was based upon man's ability to keep it and therefore a covenant that was focused in the realm of the flesh in the new covenant we are dealing with the realm of the spirit and this is where god has uh, through the power of the gospel allowed man to be transformed out of the realm of the flesh out of i gotta do it to live if you please um and i gotta live by my works and particularly that was works of the law or works of merit and now we're in the realm of grace and works by faith and so the realm of the spirit those are two covenantal modes of existence and all you have to do is read the new testament and you'll find it let me give you uh, a few scriptures so that you can understand what we mean by it if you were to go to john chapter one john the first chapter starting in verse 11 jesus said He came to his own, or John wrote this, of Christ. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right or the authority to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Now just think about that text for just a moment, because John 1, 11 through 13 it says he came to his own. Right, 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 right. So those were the Israelites, Jews, right, right the, the Jews. Jews. Right, right. And yet, it says many of them did not receive him, uh -huh. but as many as received him, to those he gave the power oh. to become children of God. Children of God. Amen. Amen. So isn't that telling you that they were not children Amen. of God Amen. in the spirit? Amen. in terms, And we'll see that in a moment. So he was giving them the power to become children of God or sons of God. 
And notice in the verse 13, it well, even the latter part of it, it says, to those who do what? Who believe on his name, okay. all right? So those who accepted the authority, the authority of the Messiah. Then next he says, who were born not of blood, uh -huh. nor of the will of the flesh, mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. nor of the will of man, right. but of God. Now the will of the flesh and the will of man are not necessarily the same thing, okay? okay? okay. So when you talk about the will of man, you talk about the will of the flesh, the will of the flesh has to do with the covenant into which they had come. So they're in the covenant of the flesh, mm -hmm. and they have to move from the covenant of the flesh through or, or to the covenant of the spirit. So that's the backdrop of the New Testament was those two covenants. Okay, can I ask you a question? Certainly. Okay, now, so now, this is more uh, looking at the spiritual man, right? Mm -hmm. So I was asked a question last night. When did Israel become a nation? Well, I said, well... This was my response. True Israel became a nation when Christ hit the scene under the gospel. So with this right here will be that same true Israel, right? Correct. This, this is not a uh, fleshly Israel right Correct. now that he's Correct. hidden on. He hidden on the people that's going to inherit the kingdom. That's right. Okay. okay. This is not the um, people who were uh, a part of the nation, as you say, uh, those who were in the flesh, those who had the old covenant, the temple, all those outward things, the animal sacrifices. This is the new nation that would come about through faith in Christ. Okay. And so that's why he gave them power to become sons of God. Now, they're also referred to in John chapter 3. And in John chapter 3, he tells them, beginning at verse 3, uh, and this is after Nicodemus comes to him by night, and, and Nicodemus says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who comes from God, mm -hmm. for no man can do these miracles that you do unless or except God is with him. Right. And Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, uh -huh. he cannot see the kingdom of God. Right. So this entrance into the kingdom requires a whole new birth. Oh, yes. Now, now I'm feeling something now. I'm okay. feeling something now. Spiritual right. birth. Right, right. Yes. And um, Nicodemus, you know, not quite understanding what right. the Lord was talking about. Every he time, raised the question. Go ahead, Martin. Every time they misunderstood him is because they was thinking literal and physical stuff. That's right. So that, that was And that's how most did. people go wrong with their eschatology. Right. right. They are thinking in the world below, and Jesus is trying to talk to them about the world above. Right. Amen. right. They're thinking in the realm of the flesh, and he's trying to speak to them in the realm of the spirit. Right. Exactly. right. And if you read the Gospel of John, you will see that paradigm over and over again on almost every page. And what kind of physical kingdom, anyway, stop you from entering? If you haven't been born again spiritually. Right. I mean, what kind of physical kingdom would do that? <laughs> you, 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 yeah, you know, <laughs> it's just not possible. Right. They're just standing at the gates. Ho, ho, ho. Yeah. Have you been born again? <laughs> well, come on in. <laughs> Show us your proof. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right. So he, he's Nicodemus, who didn't understand right. what it all meant. He raised the question. Because he knew how he had gotten into the covenant of the flesh. He was born into it. Mm -hmm. All right. And so he asked the question, how can a man, he didn't say how can a baby. Uh -huh. right. He said, how can a man, right. all right, int or be born when he is what? When he is old. Uh -huh. See, a lot of people miss this. Right. But it says when he is old. It didn't say when he was a baby. Right. Okay. This is talking about being born again as grown. an old man, right, as right. a grown man. Right. When you're grown. Right, right. And then he says, can, um, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? Now, I know the women are tripping out on this. It's enough to bring a baby into this world, right? Well, what you're talking about a grown man. How are you going to put that grown man right. in my stomach? That's not going to work. Now, the background for Nicodemus. Yes. Could you uh, explain who Nicodemus was? Well, he was a ruler of the Jews. Okay. Okay. And uh, probably a member of the Sanhedrin. Okay. All right. And so he was a person that was supposed to be aware 
and knowledgeable of the things of the Old Testament, the things of God. So he should he should have known the Torah and the Tanakh. Most the certainly. Ten, the Tanakh. Most certainly. He should have known. Okay. It, all right. Okay. And that's what Jesus says to him. And so he asked, can a man enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Which means that he's thinking in the realm of the flesh. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And it's impossible to do what he has just suggested right, to do. Right. And so Jesus reiterates it and he says it in a different way. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, verse five, okay. unless one is born of water mm -hmm. and the spirit, mm -hmm. he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, mm -hmm. I've been talking to some guys who are trying to evade the essentiality of being born again through uh, baptism. Okay. And um, and we're not talking about baptismal regeneration. This is not the Catholic doctrine of right. regeneration, right. okay? Where they think that you put some miracle dust in the water, so to speak, and then <laughs> right. it, it transform you. That's not what we're talking about at all. But the statement that he makes is he had to be born of water and of the spirit. Now, one of the things that they wanted to do was to claim that this is an Old Testament ritual. Right. Okay. Right. Now, if it is an Old Testament ritual, and, and the second thing that they wanted to do was, in, in one of the cases, they wanted to separate the water from the spirit in, in terms of um, saying that the water was the first birth. And some people argue that because they will say, well, the water is you coming from your mother's womb and then the spirit. But no, Jesus wow. said that you had to be born of water and of the spirit. So whatever being born again entails involves being born of water and of the spirit. Now, if you look in verse six, he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Okay. So if that is the case, then uh, if you're going to make the water your natural birth, then that would have to be uh, the flesh. Okay. okay. But again, the flesh here is the covenant, the, the, the mode of existing in the covenant. And, um, and and he's not telling us that we have to be born under the old covenant in order to enter into the new. One of the statements that Jesus made during his ministry was regarding the, remember the wine skins? Uh -huh. And he says, you don't take new stuff, put it in the old. Let's yeah, yeah, that. exactly. Okay, um, the wine skin stuff? The wine skins. Yeah. You don't take new wine and put it into old wine skins. Right, 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 right. Because... You know, the old wine skins burst. will burst. Right. You know, they, they don't have the elasticity right. of the new, et cetera. So he's not trying to mix in the new covenant with the old covenant. Mm, that's <laughs> powerful. Yes. That's Amen. powerful. And, Amen. and so, but this that's is what right. some of them are saying. So that which is born of the flesh, he says, is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. But if you under, want to understand that, you go back to chapter one, where he says, he gave them the power to become children of God, and children of God would be children of the Spirit. And I'll show you that in a moment. Mm -hmm. They would be children of the Spirit, and it has nothing to do with your biology. Right. In other words, if you're a child of the flesh, you're going to be, as some people say, body, soul, and spirit. Right. And then if you become a child of the Spirit, uh -huh. you're still body, soul, right. and spirit. Right, right, right. So it has nothing to do with a change in your biology. You are still the same biological makeup. Uh, or physiological makeup, however you want to say it, as you were before. The difference is your covenantal stance before God. What you have done is you have changed your covenant relationship with God mm -hmm. from the covenant of the flesh to the covenant of the spirit. Now, when Jesus came into the world, he came into the realm of the flesh. Right. Okay. And if you read Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, the Bible says this, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. The law. Okay. So he was made under the law and his purpose in coming was so that he could die. But when he died, he died to Redeemed. the law. Right. Okay. Right. And his purpose was to redeem those who were under the law, which means the word redeem, we talked about that once before. Uh -huh. Now, who remembers what redeem means? What is redeem all about? Ain't it about purchasing? It's about purchasing, but purchasing who? Or what? Uh, 
the slave. A slave. Right, That's right. 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 It's yeah. the purchase Make of a slave. Mm -hmm. All right. And the reason he was buying them was so that he could make them sons. Right. So those who were under Torah were considered as slaves. Right. All right. And, and that's Galatians no, chapter three. And they and, had no inheritance. And, right? and, and therefore, and a slave has no inheritance. You've been watching some videos. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just studying a little bit. That's right. That's right. That's right. So a slave has no inheritance. The only re the only time a slave would receive an inheritance is when the father of the house would call him a son. Now, if you go back to Ishmael and Isaac, who were uh, living in Abraham's house together, you will note that Abraham referred to Ishmael as, as his son, mm -hmm. and there, and he was the firstborn. Right, 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 okay, right, right. and therefore Ishmael was entitled to an inheritance. Right. So when he began to mock Isaac, what did Sarah say? Hey, get the cast out, yeah, cast cast out, out the bond woman and, and her son. Yes. Why? So he would be no inheritance. Inheritance. So, right. yes, for he shall not be heir with my, my son, son Isaac. Right. But prior to that casting out, he was an heir. Right. And if he had stayed in that in that position, he would have had the right to the inheritance of the firstborn. Right. All right. So and even though he was a servant, because he was born of a bond woman. Right. All right? Right, right. And if you look in Galatians 4, that's exactly what that is teaching. But he draws that um, allegory as uh, a picture of Israel under the old covenant compared to those under the new covenant. Now, so back to uh, where we were on Christ. I want to talk about this because this is important. And hello to all of you, um, Gary, John, Sel Selah, I uh, hope I got that right, Howard, Paul, Paul, what's up? <laughs> uh, Theodore. Yeah, he, he's the guy uh, I debated last night. Oh, okay. Paul, Paul. All right. Uh, and okay. Christina, appreciate everybody being here. Okay, so the... Oh, Death of Christ um, was a death to the law. Now, if you if you recall in Romans 7 and verse 1, Paul wrote to those who knew the law, and he says, uh, yeah, go ahead and pull that up. He says, brethren, I speak to those who um, know the law, that the law has dominion over a man so long as he what? Lives. As he lives. It's just like we're under the laws of the country and the cities and states in which we live, right? Yeah. But if we die, those laws have no more restrictions on us. Right. No more it. income tax, you know, well, no he, more. He compares it to the uh, wife and the uh, husband. Right? right, right, he does. But the point I want to bring out is simply that, that <clears throat> when a person dies, he is no longer under uh, obligation. the obligation right. to that law now. I mean, how can it? <laughs> exactly. It did. So here's here's the deal. When Jesus died on the cross, Jesus was dying to the realm into which he came, right. which was the realm of the flesh. Okay. So he died, and and this is uh, if you look in Luke nine and verse thirty one, at the time of the transfiguration on the mount, when Moses and Elijah appeared with Christ and um, Peter said, you know, Lord, it's good for us to be here. And he said, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. And then while he yet spoke, a loud voice came out of the cloud and said, you know, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. Well, what they talked about is very, very important. And if you look in Luke's account, Luke will tell you what that conversation between Moses and Elijah uh, was between uh, the three of them, between Christ, Moses, and Elijah. What were they talking about? They was talking about his death, right? That's right. Luke 9 and verse 31 says, they spoke of his decease, which he would accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, if you look up the word decease in the... Um, in the text, look it up in the Greek, the word decease is the word exodus. Okay. Well, you have the prefix ex, what does that mean? Exit? 
it's, it means it, out. Out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And <laughs> exit is one of the words we get from that. Right. Okay. So it means out, and then hadas means a road. So it's a road out or a way out. All right. So what they talked about was the exodus that Jesus was going to make from the world into which he came. Okay. From the covenant world into which he came. Okay. All right. And so that's what their discussion was. Mm -hmm. He was about to make his exodus. Now, back if you go back in the Old Testament and you look at the Israelites in um, no, in the book of Exodus, when they were enslaved, they made an exodus from the land of Egypt. Right. Mm, right All right. Right. So this was the second exodus. So this is the beginning, beginning. of the second exodus. Man, you're on the ball. <laughs> I don't know what they fed you on that plane when you were coming in. I think it was that this guy's all the way from California, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. I think it was some of that soul food. All man. right. He said it was the soul food. I that took him out to a soul food cooking. restaurant, and he's this got him on fire. So Jesus is beginning the second exodus. This is the backdrop of the entire New Testament that people just butcher because they don't get it. They don't see the nature of it. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. So um, Jesus begins the second exodus. In other words, he is the new Moses. Amen. That's about to lead the slaves out from the old covenant, the realm of the flesh, into the new covenant, the realm of the spirit. Mm -hmm. Out of sin and death. Out of sin and death. Mm -hmm. And Exodus was a type of death. Right. Because the, the way the Bible pictures being in captivity is a state of death. Because you're not where you can live freely and be the person and the nation that you are designed to be. So it is. it was a state of death. So Exodus... Being in Egypt was a type of death. Um, in any captivity, in Babylon, was a type of death. As a matter of fact, if you go to Isaiah chapter 26, and you look in verse 13, and this is also in Ezekiel 37, but in Isaiah 26, he says, Lord, you will establish peace for us. The word peace is a beautiful term too, because it means to bind together. That's the basic mean, meaning of the word peace in the in the Greek from the word iro. It means to bind together. So two uh, beings like man and God are separated from each other because of man's sin. That's Isaiah 59. So to make peace means to bring the two back together, to bring man back to God. All right. And that's what Christ's death was all about. It was to bring man back to God so that there would be peace between man and his creator. So he says, Lord, you will establish peace for us, for you have also done all our works in us. O Lord, our God. Now watch this. Masters besides you have had dominion over us. So they're talking about their captors. They're talking about the people who have them in captivity. And he says, but by you only, we make mention of your name. Now watch, they are dead. What he's talking about now is they are being released from captivity. Okay. Mm -hmm. Their reign over Israel has ceased. Yes, sir. Right. All right. And that's what that's saying. He says, they are deceased. They will not rise. Therefore, you have punished and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. You have increased the nation. O oh Lord, you have increased the nation, you are glorified, and you have expanded all the borders of the land. All right. So this is also prophetic, because if you read the rest of it, you know, you will see that. Uh, and, and, and this is also, um, uh, what's the term I'm looking for, preceded by the birth pangs. Anytime God is going to bring them out, this is like the birth of a nation. Right, right. And the birth of a nation was always preceded by birth pangs. Right. So... In this text, if you look down in verse 17, 16 to 17, he says, Lord, in trouble, they have visited you. They poured out a prayer when your chastening was upon them. Now, when was he chastening them? When they were in, in what? Egypt. In Egypt and also in Babylon, in Babylon. et cetera. Yeah. All so captivities. all captivities. Right, right. That's the Lord chastening them for their sins, et cetera. And he says, as a woman with child is in pain 
and cries out in her pains when she draws near the time of delivery. So when a woman goes into her birth pains, uh -huh. we know it's time for the what? The baby. The, the baby, baby to come. come. All right, right, exactly. And so when she draws near the time of her delivery, so have we been in your sight, O oh Lord. So now they're saying we've been in, in, in this state of death, uh -huh. and now we are about to be born. We're about to come out of this state of death and therefore be born into a nation or re, re, uh, um, connected with, with the land. Now, what's interesting also in Hebraic literature, okay. and I have a book up there. Elvin, if you will reach right up there. Uh, on the top shelf, it's about the th the second book from that white book that you see right there. Right here? Yeah, it's that tan colored book. All, All right, right, pull that down. This one? Yes, okay. that's it. I think this is the right one. Uh, this is not the right one. It's another one by him that's up there. Get the one right next to it. Let's see what that is. Yes, this is it. All right. Now, this book is called, let's see if I can get it to show. Da, 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 da. All right. Resurrection and the restoration of Israel, the ultimate victory of the God of life by John D. Levinson. He was a, he's a Yale scholar. Um, and one of the things that he points out, it's a good book to read so that you can understand death and resurrection from a Hebraic mindset. But one of the things that he points out is a barren woman was also that was also considered a state of death. Right, if you right. had no children, it was considered a state of death. And one of the things that was very, very important to the Hebrews was to have many children. Right. All right. And so a woman who was barren was always looked upon in a very negative light. Okay. So it was like her womb was dead. Okay. And that's also where the levered marriage thing comes from, right, where right, if right. she had no children, they had to, you know, um, have the um, the closest family member, male marry his brother's right, wife right. and raise up seed so that the name wouldn't be cut off from Israel. So this represents a state of death. And so these birth pangs is demonstrating a time of life, which would be resurrection from death. Right. Okay. So he says, we have been with child. We have been in pain. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have not accomplished any deliverance in the earth. We have, or nor have the inhabitants of the world fallen. So their complaint before God is this. We have not been delivered. Right. You know, we're in the throes of, of the birth pangs, and where's the result? Yeah. There's, you yeah. know, and, and so he says, your dead shall live. That's God's promise to them. Your dead shall live. But ladies and gentlemen, understand this. He's not talking about a body coming up out of the ground. This is people coming out of captivity. And the correlation between that is people who are in bondage to sin, uh -huh. which is why Jesus came to start the second exodus so he could deliver them out of the bondage and the captivity yes. of sin. Yeah. And a lot of people don't get that. Right. So that's why they're getting into this cosmic eschatology and this biological eschatology and talking about physical bodies coming out of the ground instead of talking about man coming out of the greatest captivity that he could ever be in, and that was the one that separated him from his creator. Right. All right. right. And so when he says, nor have the inhabitants of the world fallen, as long as those leaders are ruling over them, they're still in the state of death. Okay. okay. Right. And so he says, your dead shall live together with my dead body. They shall arise, awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. Now, dwelling in the dust is Israel in captivity. Mm -hmm. That's what that means. It doesn't mean that they're buried in the literal ground. Dwelling in the dust means that they are in captivity. They are not in their state of glory and blessing as a nation. And so he says, together with my dead body, they shall rise, awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. For your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, into your chambers, shut your doors behind you, hide yourself as it were for a little moment until the indignation is past. Well, now if you're dead, what indignation are you going through? Right, See, right. this is God's wrath and chastisement that has to pass. And when that's done, then they can come out right. of their state of death. And so he says, for behold, the Lord comes out of his place. Mm -hmm. Now here's the coming of the Lord. Uh-huh, uh-huh comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth, right? Mm -hmm. And the earth will also disclose her blood 
and no more cover her slain. So, so, so can I ask you a question? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Since we're talking about captivity, uh -huh. right? Mm -hmm. So, what's the difference between the captivity that you're reading in Isaiah and the 1619 captivity? What's the difference between them? One, this one is prophetic. Okay. And it relates to uh, Israel's experience in the scriptures. Okay. The one in 1619 has no biblical support whatsoever. Okay. 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 And um, here's another major difference. Israel was carried into this captivity, just like Deuteronomy 28 says. Uh-huh from their own land right they weren't in a foreign land mm -hmm. and then carried to another foreign land mm -hmm. okay that is contrary to the scripture okay before you leave that point go now, ahead i want just to make sure mm -hmm. you're saying that the curse the curse is a deuteronomy mm -hmm. and you're not in the camera man i want my bad let me give me a fast <laughs> go ahead. the curses of deuteronomy it was they had to be taken captive from their land. Yes. Not a foreign land. Not a foreign land. So anything dealing with a foreign land is not biblical. That's right. Okay. Every time the Bible speaks of, <laughs> if you read Deuteronomy, go back and read it again for yourself. Every time and every curse that was coming upon them was a curse that was coming upon them while they were in their land to remove them out of the land or to bring some pestilence or whatever while they were in the land. There is never a time where it talks about them being outside of their land and then carried off to some other place. So now, do those curses, because this is another one, mm -hmm. so do those curses follow them when they go to another land? Well, if you're talking about the curses that were in the, in the scripture in Deuteronomy mm -hmm. 28, no, because Christ removed that curse. That curse is not on right. them anymore. And... Um, so you can't transfer a curse that's been removed and and send it. The only reason people would be under a curse now is because they just refuse to accept Christ. Okay, okay, that's okay. that's the only okay, curse. Okay, okay, okay. It's dangerous to believe that too. Right, it's right. really dangerous. Right. Because what that creates is a mental form of slavery, to where you think you are enslaved, and you cannot think you are a slave and behave or perform like a free I'm person. A free person. And we, uh, That's incompatible. We That's had that problem this whole week. Well, it was some of this week, wasn't it? When we was talking about how free we are in America compared to how they was not in free in the mm -hmm, Bible. Mm -hmm. And people came with way different methods on how we're not free right. compared to how yeah, we are I, free. I seen that on your page. Yes. Uh, yes, saying you can leave to this place, you can leave that place. Leave to that. Right. I, mean, <laughs> I mean, truthfully, what captivity right. could the Israelites just pick up and leave right. and say, well, King Nebuchadnezzar, it's been fun. Right. But we about to go <laughs> to this country. we going to go over here. <laughs> uh, in the 16, 1619, when we came over here to America, right. you couldn't just tell when them could that? they just up and just leave? Like, right. hey, you know what, Master? But they I'm out. It. They were trying to say things like, oh, you because you're paying taxes. Right. <laughs> you gotta pay your life bill. Because yeah. <laughs> you gotta get a passport. You're right. Uh, so you gotta get a passport to leave. And like everybody gotta get there. It's not just us. That's right. <laughs> but but like it's it's dangerous out there. And how can and we can go right back to the scripture, but how can you teach if you know that the black community is suffering, right? And we already got a lot of load on our backs. So once you put the curses and us being curses on top of that, or us being cursed on top of that, it's it's just an ingredient for destruction because now you're telling your kids that you're going through this stuff because of a divine exactly a divine thing. So don't it's you can't better yourself right. because you're not bigger than God. Yeah, because right. you would be di being be being disobedient to God right. to try to break a divine curse right. that he's put on you. I mean, think about it. Even in Jeremiah, what did he tell them? He says, when you're in a foreign land, he said, seek the peace of the land. Uh -huh. He didn't say rebel against right. it. Right. And uh, the only time they were to return was through the, or and at the time of the return of Christ. Right. Now, those who consider themselves the like some of the Ashkenazi Jews, I've talked to them. I've had... Um, 
one of the guys on my radio show before. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a while back, and you know maybe it's still archived out there somewhere. But his name is Dovid Weiss. You can look him up. Um, and I think their organization was JewsForJudaism.org. Okay. But when we had that conversation on the radio, uh -huh. he gave me four reasons. And usually I can't remember them. One time I looked <laughs> up and I remember them all. But he gave me four reasons uh -huh. why Israel could not go back into the land. Okay. He said, one, they cannot use military force. Right. Okay. Now look at what the Zionists do. Right. They straight up military. Straight up military. Right. right. All right. He said um, they couldn't go back before Christ came. He said Christ was the only one who could lead them back into the land. Okay. Well, where's Christ? They don't even believe in him. Right. In, right, in right, Zionism. Right. 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 All right. Secondly, That's I mean, thirdly, they said that um, they were to seek the peace of the nations where they were, all over, around, wherever they were yeah. around the world. And I can't remember the, like I said, I can never remember the fourth one. Uh, I lucked up one night and got all four. But that's been years ago since I had that conversation with him. It's been, I think, probably 2009 or 10 when I uh, had that conversation with him. And um, so he, he just shared that with me. And he says, and that's why we don't support Zionism, because of the things that they do. And um, so if. If, and, and his point was, if we force our way back into the land, we are being disobedient to the, yeah. to the Lord based right. on that paradigm right. that you're out here under a divine curse. Right. So uh -huh. you're supposed to grin and bear it. In other words, is what he was saying. So that's why I'm saying it's, it's dangerous to, you know, if that's your paradigm, to be under that um, or to labor under that paradigm. Now, what's equally dangerous is to have the Christian Zion, and I just closed that that uh, page. Let me see if I, I think I closed that page. Mm. Now this this may be it. Let me see if I can pull this up for everybody to see it. Mm. See if I can do a share here. Next time, instead of us starting our own watch party, we should uh, you should just tag us both. So that way it's not three separate, you know. Okay. Parties. I'll tell you what. I'm just going to leave that alone for right now. I got it here. I can just pull it up. That's what he has to do. I'll yeah, pull it up and read it. So let me see. That's not the one. This one. So about to be all right. Now, now listen to this. And I know you all can still uh, see us. But I'm going to read this. Okay. This is just a paragraph. It's just an excerpt. It says, White Evangelicals. Once and still the greatest source of anti-Semitism in the U.S. are paradoxically the firmest supporters of warrior Israel and its Bible-mandated role in ushering in the coming tribulation and Christ's defeat of evil. Accordingly, 53% of evangelical Christians supported President Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital, while 63% of the general U.S. public opposed the move and he says, Reverend William Alberts, the counterpunch minister, writes that 87% of U.S. white evangelicals rallied to George Bush's Iraq war because their spiritual leaders thought the invasion would create exciting new prospects for proselytizing Muslims. Re Reverend Albert calls the biblically legitimized, oh, excuse me, calls this biblically legitimized imperialism. But white Americans don't require divine sanction to find excuses for killing non-whites. It's how the West was won and how the U.S. became a superpower. Now, the, the point that I wanted to make from that was that you have what's called Christian Zionist groups who, because of their eschatology, are fueling the Zionism that is existing in Israel to this day. So uh, you've got one group that is advocating the very things that the other group says they shouldn't be doing, right. you know, in terms of, of this killing, these wars, et cetera, et cetera. And they're doing that in the name of Christian Zionism because of their futurism. And a lot of people are not aware that this Christian Zionism, what, what we're calling Christian Zionism, you know, this political land grab that's taking place in Israel that has been going on since 1948 and actually through the Balfour Declaration from 1917, and the groundwork being laid by um, Theodore Herzl even earlier than that, you know, in the latter part of the 19th, um, 
uh, 19th century, yeah, or the 20th century. Later, does some reading, y'all. Some the stuff. latter part of the, of the 20th century. This was going on long before 1948. See, um, they had been scheming and planning this for a long time. But anyway, um, because people are not aware of that, what they did was they had planned long before that they were going to influence Christian churches to become pro-Zionist. Mm -hmm. And they did that by creating a Bible called the Schofield Reference Bible. Now, Samuel Untermeyer was the financier of that Bible. He was a, he was a, a, a Jewish lawyer, and um, he financed the Bible. It was published by the Oxford Bible Society, Oxford University, and um, that's what we call the Schofield Reference Bible. Now, here's, <laughs> I was telling somebody this the other day. Okay, what they did in that Bible was they put a marginal reference in it, and they put verses that they thought tied to Zionism and the rapture and things like that. They had a margin at the bottom, and they put notes in the bottom of the Bible. And because people don't study the Bible as a rule, they would go and read the notes <laughs> instead of the verses. Right. And they started believing the notes the over verse. the Bible. Right. And right. They, they made sure that that Bible got into all the um, seminaries, all the um, churches, etc. And this is why it would be rare for you to go to a Christian church today and find one that is not pro-Israel, pro-Israeli, yeah. okay, yeah. pro-Zionist. Right. And they would almost literally want to fight you for, you know, praying for the peace of the Zionist movement. Right. You know, they'll say pray for the peace of Israel, but what they mean is Zionism. And, um, it, and so all this killing and blood and guts and bombing and stuff they're doing, Christians are you know, these so-called Christian Zionists right. are sanctioning it because they don't understand the scriptures. Right. And so. So, so no they're using the Bible to do all of that. Exactly. Evil, 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 evil. Exactly. Exactly. So they're doing the things that even some of these Jews wouldn't do. Right. And they're saying, so if you've ever heard, you know, of John Hagee and um, uh, these kind of men, that's exactly what they're doing. Now, I've got some videos, a couple of videos reviewing John Hagee's In Defense of Israel online, and I get responses from that video all day long of people just sending me just, you know, really, really powerful comments about the information in that. So I would recommend that you watch that if you haven't. So, my, so here's a question there. Uh -huh. uh, it's not off subject, but it kind of is, but here's a question. So what do you say to the people that say, well, this is a Hebrew book anyway, so it doesn't matter what the Gentiles are doing with the book. <laughs> so, so what do you, what do you, what do you, what's the, your response? For that? Saying, oh. Well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> before, <laughs> before there was a Jew, uh -huh. there was Adam mm -hmm. and uh, Abraham. Okay. So if you look in the book of Hebrews, you got a lot of people before we ever get to Jacob, right? Right. And uh, even after that, there were those who were not native Israelites that the Bible um, spoke of coming into uh, into the faith. And so uh, while the book was primarily, see, God gave it to Israel. I mean, think about it from a practical point of view. Oh. Just, just think from a practical point of view. How many times would and how many prophets would God need to send every nation a book, a book, a Bible? A whole lot. <laughs> and then they would have to all get together yeah. and to say we're all interpreting it right, etc. Right, I mean, right, right, right. it's not practical. God follows a principle of parsimony, right. where He only does what's necessary. Right. He's not going to overuse resources. He's not going to underuse them. Right. So He chose one nation to to deposit this with. And then they were to reach out to so the nations of the world. Right, right. Exactly. And that is the most efficient and the effective way to do it. To give everybody a Bible. And to be an effective. And try to, you know, do you know how many Exodus you'd have to, you talk about people not reading one Bible. Yeah. Right. <laughs> 70 nations, right, right? Right. All of them got a scheme of redemption program. How many saviors would that take? It just it's not, doesn't even make sense. So, um, so they was never supposed to take that knowledge and keep it to themselves. No. No. They were supposed to share it with the nations. Okay. 
and God holds those nations responsible. I mean, if he charges them with sin, which he did, all well, you have to look at is go back and read Genesis. Pharaoh, um, all through, you find, you know, the people of Shechem, I mean, you just, all through, mm -hmm. you'll see where all those people are charged with sin. Now, why are they charged with sin? They broke some law of God. Right, right, right. And if they weren't under Torah, then some of that was even before Torah. Uh, some kind of covenant. They right. were under a covenant relationship with God. So I got another heat for you. I got another heat one. Mm -hmm. So at what point, at what point, or what covenant was it okay for the so-called Gentiles to start teaching the Bible, even to the so-called Hebrews? So at what point, or what covenant, was it ordained for the people that was not the national, this ain't spiritual, but the national people to start learning from the Gentiles? Okay. Um, okay, that's what we're that's what we're talking about. Right it would, it would have to start after the new covenant began and after the Gentiles came into the faith. Okay. So I would see that, you know, from Acts 10 and following. Uh, because that would be the time that they have come into the faith. Okay. And um, from that from that point forward, you know, you would have them in and they're teaching. Now, one of the things that people teach was that, like with, with some churches, they, they teach a total replacement, that the Gentiles replaced Israel. And Paul said, no, God had not cast away the people right. whom he foreknew. And so that's, that's not the case of Romans chapter 11. But certainly um, those who are in Christ are empowered with the responsibility and as they have the opportunity to teach others that's right. what, that's what paul said and so it's not limited to just one people teaching uh teaching everybody in the new testament because, everybody is commanded because it went over to the spiritual israel anyway exactly so if you're a spiritual israel you can teach the word of god exactly okay then. exactly okay, okay. And and so back on that that theme that we were developing, so right. we we stopped kind of talking about Christ right, and the right, Exodus. Right. So what you have is the second Exodus that's beginning through Christ. But it's important to understand that Jesus died to the old covenant, uh -huh. and when he rose from the dead, he was no longer under the old covenant. He was in he was now in the realm of the spirit, even though he still had body right. and bones, etc. You know, flesh and bone. Um, now, where do I get that from? Well, if you return to Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. All right, Romans 1, 3 and 4. Romans 1, 3 and 4. All right. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh. All right, now underline that phrase, according to the flesh, okay? Okay. You should do a word study on that, or just just go through your Bible. You know, get get out Strong's Concordance, or go to Bible Hub and just look up that phrase according to the flesh. You'll see it occur over and over and over again. It does not mean that Christ had flesh and did not have spirit. It meant that when he was born as the seed of David, it's just like we said before, he came into the old covenant. Of flesh into the realm of flesh. Ah, I got, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So what do you do when they uh, pull up the word seed and then they go and say, well, seed means sperma. So it has to come through sperm. Hmm. So so what, 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 how do you combat that? Well, I don't disagree with the fact that, that it came through, um, you know, that he was, as the scripture says, one of your own body who shall come from your own body all right that's what second samuel 7 uh 12 through 14 says and also what acts chapter 2 says okay. okay but it's also pointing out that when he came through david he came into the old covenant okay so it is it's not one negating the other it's the fact that when he came into the realm of the flesh being born of the seed of David, he is still into the old covenant realm. Okay. All right. Well, this is this is what I'm gonna give you what they what they okay. give you. This is what they will say. Okay. The Israelites went through the Father in order to determine the genealogy. So, the king had to be born 
through what well, the Messiah had to be born through uh, David's lineage. Mm-hmm. And in order for Christ to be of David's lineage through his father, Joseph had to be his biological father. Mm-hmm. Because if Joseph was not his biological father, that means that Christ does not have a lineage mm-hmm. back to the king. Okay. Yeah. They say that all the time. Yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, you know, that's, the that's, Holy that's Spirit came upon them and all yeah. that okay. stuff. They still have a, um, they'll, they'll bring up John. Jesus was linked to David through both Mary and Joseph. Okay. okay. Through Joseph, he had the regal, he had the right, the regal right to the throne. Okay. All right, what's 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 regal right? Yeah. Can you, can you tell well, what regal, regal has to do with the reign and okay. the throne? Okay. Okay. All right. And through Mary, he had, you know, that was the flesh okay. in terms of you know coming because he wasn't Joseph's natural son. See, that's what they're trying to push. I know, okay. I know. Okay. Okay. But see, okay. here's the deal. Okay. So he 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 comes through Mary to qualify him as the seed of David. You know, in the flesh, etc. Okay, so the seed of David is qualified through the woman. Well, he is a he is technically the seed of David David. through the woman, right? right, right? Yes, yes. And I don't know why that should be a a difficult thing because it even said in Genesis that the seed of the woman, right? right, Okay, right, right, right. right, All right, but here's the other part I wanted to bring out on that, and that is Jeremiah chapter twenty-two. Hey, y'all, I'm asking all the questions y'all will ask. And y'all see, he's telling it. He's explaining it. All right. In Jeremiah 22 and verse 24. All right. He says, as I live, says the Lord, though Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet on my right hand, yet I would pluck you off and I will give you into the hand of those who seek your life and into the hand of those whose face you fear, the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. Um king of Babylon and the hand of the Chaldeans. So I will cast you out and your mother who bore you into another country where you were not born and there you shall die. But to the land to which they desire to return, they shall not return. Is this man Coniah a despised broken idol, a vessel in which is no pleasure? Why are they cast out, he and his descendants? Uh All right. And cast into a land which they do not know. O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, write this man down as what? Childless. 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 And we know. He had kids, right? All right, yes. Okay. But we also know that since he says write him down as childless. No one has reigned since then. He was not going to have another person to reign Mm -hmm. on earth. All right, and that's the key. Uh, He says, a man who shall not prosper in his days. For none of his descendants. And see, that's where Christ uh, cannot inherit the throne on earth. You cannot have him receiving a throne on earth because he would be of the seed of Coniah. Right. Okay. Right, right. And so. Um, that's part of the future's contradiction. Yeah. So a man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper, sitting on the throne of David and ruling anymore where? In Judah. In Judah. Uh-huh. All right. Christ's reign is not a reign in Judah. Right. All right. So since then, no one has reigned, right, on uh, in Judah. That's right. They they've not had a king on right. the throne right. since then. Right. So that's, and that's and um, yeah, it can't be a physical kingdom. Right. And the other part yeah. of that was Christ, according to Zechariah six twelve and thirteen, was to be a priest on his throne. Okay. okay. And you can't be a priest and a king right. too. And Judah. you couldn't be a priest and, and a Judah. king. Right. In mm-hmm. Israel. All right. Remember what happened to Saul when he tried to offer. That's another contradiction they'd be saying too. You know? Exactly. That they're okay with contradicting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. All right and, so, that's why, so, and that's why Jesus ran when they tried to make him king. Exactly. You know? Very good. Very yeah. good. Man, what did you eat? What did you eat? <laughs> right, I'm right. telling you, you should have come to dinner with us. <laughs> so we so we get it right though. So now Christ has the connection through the sperm of David through Mary. Mm-hmm. So, and if Joseph called him son, by default, he would be the son of mm-hmm, Joseph, mm-hmm. which would be also the son of David. Exactly. So it's a twofold. Yes. So let me. I got you. Me, I got you. Me, I got you. Me, got you. Got you. Regarding that, so the stepdad. So basically, Joseph was a stepdad. Mm-hmm. 
So a stepdad, uh, right. so there's a kid, uh, a stepchild, received the same inheritance as a ch- stepdad, or how's that? How's Say that? what now? Does a stepchild get the same inheritance as the uh, stepfather? If he's if he's in the position of the um, the firstborn, he would. Okay. 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 I mean, if he's referred to as which, which he was the first as his son, yeah, All right. But see, Christ couldn't inherit anything in the realm of the flesh, right? Mm-hmm. And that's also a key point. The promises of God could not be fulfilled in the realm of the flesh. Look, look at Romans we, fifteen. Yeah, 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 yeah. we yeah. go there. <laughs> this is key, actually. This one. Yeah, yeah, uh, this one. I don't want to break up the flow. No, no, I'm I'm good. Oh, no, no, I just got to respond real fast. Okay, go ahead. Raymond, okay, we <laughs> we saw some of the debate too. Yeah. So they didn't watch all of it, but you see how they smirk and laugh at that comment. You, you was you was, a, you was running away from questions, <laughs> man. <laughs> so so we'll let you have it, man. If you say that's what you did, that's what you did, man. All right. So in Romans chapter fifteen and verse eight, he says, "Now I say." that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, for this reason, I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, rejoice, O Gentiles, with this people. That's Deuteronomy 32. Uh, we've got Isaiah 11 in here, etc. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, laud him, all you peoples. I think we got a text from Psalms in here. And again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles hope. But the point is, Jesus could not fulfill the promises in the realm of the flesh, because he would have been considered a fleshly seed uh-huh. of Coniah, all right? And uh, not only that, but he would um, have, been. have to reign in yeah. Judah. And, and as Martin brought up from John chapter 6, I think it's verse 15, after he had fed the multitudes and they followed him, uh-huh. you know, and they wanted to make him a king. So here they are saying, okay, we're ready to have you as our king. He would have none of it. Right. Because he will be openly... Yeah, I mean, look at, the look at what happened in, is it First Samuel 8, when they said, give us a king like all the nations? Yeah. That was a great sin. And then what did God say? He says, Samuel, don't be upset. They don't, They have not rejected you, right. but they have rejected, rejected me. me. Right. Notice that I should not reign over them. So where was God? Was he on earth? Right. No, he was, no, he was reigning over them from heaven. Right. So they rejected the rule from heaven in order to have the rule of a man on earth. Mm-hmm. And then they that's what got him into a lot of trouble. And then in Hosea chapter 13, God says, I am your king and there is no other. Mm-hmm. And he tells them, I gave you a king in my anger mm-hmm. and I wrath. took him away my in my wrath. wrath. Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. And so he was trying to tell them, I'm the only king that you will ever have. And so Christ rose from the dead ascended back to the throne of God so he could reign over all of his kingdom Just from heaven. Did. So he ran away. Christ ran away from the throne, the earthly throne. The earthly throne. Twice. Yes. The first time he was in uh, the wilderness doing yes. the 40-day fast. Exactly. And he said, if you bow down before me, you can have all, all, the, kingdoms. all the kingdoms. Yes. So he ran away from it then, and yeah. then he ran away from the children of Israel. Yes. So he was letting them be known, I will not have no that's King right, because he knew that that was a violation of the will of God. Right, 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 right. And um, right. all of our redemption would have gone under, the, gone down the drain mm. had he accepted a, a role of king on earth. And, and yet, that, that's what Zionism proposes. Right, right. See, people don't understand this doctrine of, of the rapture and of bringing Christ back to the earth to reign on the throne of Jerusalem mm-hmm. is Zionist doctrine, and it is uh, contrary to what the scriptures teach. So... Uh, if you want to go back to Jerusalem, you're trying to get Christ to apostatize. That's right. basically what you're trying to get him to do, and that just doesn't work. So that's an, anti- that, that's an antichrist doctrine. Right. That's an antichrist doctrine. Yes, it is antichrist. And not only that, and I forgot what scripture you can help me out with this, where he says, I only do what I see the Father. He says, I only do what I see the Father, mm-hmm. the Father do or whatever. Mm-hmm. So since the Father was reigning from heaven, 
Right. Hey, that's that's where he needs to run from. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Very I like good. that. I like that. All right. So um now, so now we're in the second exodus where Christ has died, uh -huh. uh, leaving the realm of the flesh, okay. entering into the realm of the spirit. spirit. Right. Okay. And thereby becoming the second Moses. So we talked about um, some of that. Now, I don't want to interrupt you. Go but ahead. I got to. Go ahead. Go ahead. Real fast. All right. Did Christ say anything about the Mosaic covenant when he resurrected? Did he say anything about the Mosaic covenant? Um, the only thing that he said that I understand was that he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures and told them what was coming. Right. You know, I mean, it, but he never told them, y'all go back and do what the priests say do. No. Not one time. No, no, no. When no, he no, resurrected. No. No. Right, no. He always pointed okay. them to uh, okay. the fulfillment of those. Things. I didn't want to, I didn't want to stop you, but that, that's important information for some of the people out there. Also, okay. who All think right. we're still under the most. Yeah. All right. So then if you look at Romans, and, and I wanted to point this out from 1 Corinthians, just so everybody could see what we're talking about in terms of, of the natural man and the spiritual man. Okay. Now, the natural man, this comes from the Greek word sukikos. Mm -hmm. And the difference between the natural man is not that one has a physical body and the other one doesn't. Right. Okay. The difference between those two is that one has the Holy Spirit according to what was written in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. One was given the spirit and the other was not. That's what separated the Jews in the Bible. Right, right. So those who said they were Jews and were not were those who did not have the spirit. Oh, hold oh, on oh, now. You just took the synagogue of Satan. Well, you just took them from the white man and you gave them right back to the Jews. That's who it was. Okay. That's who it was. It's it's okay. not well, Revelation two yeah, three, yeah. Nine, three nine three nine. Yeah, he just took it right. He, he just took it from the white man. Right. Wait a minute. Right back to so let, let me ask you this: since you <laughs> since you brought that up, where in the Old Testament do you find a prophecy referring to <laughs> to them, you know, to non-Israelites in terms of of right, right. this covenant? See. Revelation 2 9 and 3 9 is a quote from Isaiah 60. Uh oh, he's putting it together. He's putting it Isaiah together. 60. Let's go yeah, to and verse 14. Yeah, so it's that. Now, wait a minute. Now, watch this. See, what they're saying is that they got afflicted by the quote white man yes. right. in 16 19. 19. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. So but here's a text 14. in Isaiah 60 and 40 that says, also the sons of those who afflicted you. Right. Verse 14. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Shall come bowing to you. Uh -huh. I guess that's where they get that they got to come kiss their feet or something. Yes, that's okay. exactly where they get it from. <laughs> and all those who despised you shall fall prostrate at the soles of your feet, and they shall call you the city of the Lord, Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Mm. All right. Now it says the sons of those who afflicted you. Right. All right. All right. So they would have to have those of 1619 yes. afflicting them back during the time of the first century. And that doesn't work. Because if you go to the book of Revelation and just look at what the text says, 2-9 and 3-9. So that was the Jews that was trying to basically think they're going to get just by not being baptized and just fall on the old covenant. Right. Yes. Fall on the new way. Right. That's right. Jesus taught. That's right. So he says, I know your works, your tribulation and poverty, that you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Mm. This was a first century event. Right. This is not 1619. Right. This is taking <laughs> place at the time the epistle, I mean, the, the book was written. This prophecy was written. Right. And it was something that was shortly to come to pass, Revelation 1 and 1. So in 3 9, which is where you get even more specific, he says, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. So it was the Jews in the New Testament era, right. you know, in, in that pre-70 time frame, who had been persecuting the church. Right, right. That once 
their temple was seized and destroyed, they would come and acknowledge that these were that Christians were the true sons of right, God. Right, right. That's right. what that's all about. The, to to try to force it into sixteen nineteen is just totally anachronistic. You know, that's someone who doesn't care about the time statements right. and the framework of the New Testament. We have a comment. Their interpretation of the Bible makes no sense. Uh, put something down specific <laughs> to back up your comment, and we will address it. Amen. You know, if you have some something that says it makes no sense, we will definitely consider it. Uh, our point, just to reiterate, if this is the point that you are addressing, is that the book of Revelation was written in the first century. Right to people living in the first century. Right. It wasn't written to people in the 16th or 17th century. Um, <laughs> so that's what makes no sense uh, for John to be writing to people who did not live yet. Right, let me let me I say mean, something real quick. So Revelations is the last book, right? Uh, it That's could be, it written. could be, but not necessarily the last book. But anyway, but just okay. go with that. So, uh, why is there no more books beyond eighty seventy? Yeah, no more prophetic books. No more prophetic and, books, and no more books. Period. Right. A good point because inspiration ceased. <laughs> right. By right. seventy, that's Daniel nine right. twenty four. <laughs> right. Where that says seal, you know, seventy weeks are determined. Right. That's it. For the city and the sanctuary. And one of those six things that would occur was they would seal up vision and prophecy. Right. And to seal up vision and prophecy, if you study those words, it means to shut down the prophetic office and also to close all the visions, to fulfill all the visions. Right. So that there's nothing yet remaining to be fulfilled. And that all had to happen within the 70 weeks right. of Daniel's prophecy which has been fulfilled because he says the 70 weeks would end with the war. Right. You know, upon the end of the war, our desolations yes, yes, determined. Yes. So when Jews, Jerusalem was desolated, that was the end of the war. That was the end of the 70 weeks prophecy. Right. And uh, any reputable scholar will tell you that. You don't have to take our word for it. Well, can I, can because I read it, this? Because if the Bible, was, cause, you know, most people try to put themselves in the Bible. Yeah. So the Bible was still going on and there will still be more books to this day that will include them and in, like how there was an Isaiah, how there was a Malachi, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. there will be more books included. But the reason why there's not is because it's been fulfilled. Right, yes. Right. Um, and another point, <laughs> another book I'd recommend, it's called Redating the New Testament. You might be able to find it. Redating the New Testament by um, uh, John A.T. Robinson, Robinson, R-O-B-I-N-S-O-N. I would recommend you get a copy of that book. He does some great work on demonstrating um, the facts of why you cannot take any book in the New Testament <laughs> and place it after 70 AD in times of when it was written. Um, all the new books of the New Testament were written before 70 AD. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. And, and, and I put a, I put he said he went call in. There was a call in number. There was a call in number. And I, I, I give my cell phone number, but I want to just read this real fast. Mm -hmm. Revelations 1 and 4. I'm just going to start reading. Okay. Mm -hmm. It says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Okay, R, R yeah. is a <laughs> present tense <laughs> verb. Right, right. So that means at the time he wrote, there were the seven churches exactly. that were in Asia. Right. Okay, but he was writing the people. And where are those in churches Asia. at today? They gone. Right. <laughs> and then, go ahead. But now, if, if, if we write, if you write a letter to seven people right now, about events that's going to happen yeah. within the next month. They know who you talking about. somebody <laughs> read it 2,000 years from now, should those per should those people take what you're saying and act like it's about them? Well, let me give you a real life example. Let, let me give you a real life example. All right, go ahead. We have a class on Hebrew. Okay. That's, that's right. starting on the 13th uh -huh. of this of, of next month, of April. It's on the website and it's on Eventbrite, right? Mm -hmm. So you can go out there and look at it. Okay. You have until the 13th to sign up for the class. Now, if you miss the 13th mm -hmm. and we roll around to the 14th or any time afterwards, 
you can read that all you want. Right. And you can send us the money. We might keep it. <laughs> no, I'm not going to keep your money. It's just a joke. Yeah, they're going to run a little bit. Yeah, 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 don't, don't send me. After, after the 13th, look, we can only accept 20 people in the class. So if you can't get in before the number cut off, we're not going to accept it. But the point is, if you read that a year from now, because I have events that are still out there, right. you know, if you go a year from now and read that promotion, and then you want to try to go to that class, you can't because it's gone. It's, it's done. Over. It's, it's over. over with. And that's the same way that you have to understand the scripture. Now, um, you might go there and learn something about how to write the ad or promote it or something, but that's about it. You know, you can't go there. Let's see. The name Christian was a derogatory name from the people of Antioch, all because they followed Christ. But they were Israelites first and still add to and still add had, I guess they mean, to keep the law. I don't, I don't know. Where they getting this information from? Okay. I don't know. Um, I don't even know where they get this information from. The so it was a derogatory term. Yeah, that's what they say. Um, first of all, we don't disagree that the Jews were required to keep the law right. from thirty to seventy A.D. Uh, they were required to keep it. Jesus taught them that in Matthew five seventeen through nineteen. And also in Acts chapter 21, when they charged Paul with not keeping the law, James, remember when he went to Jerusalem, um, said that they had heard that those who were among the Gentiles, uh, were the Jews who were among the Gentiles, were saying that uh, Paul taught them uh, that they didn't have to keep the law, didn't have to circumcise mm -hmm. their children, etc. And they proved that that was a lie. You know, they, they demonstrated that it was a lie. And... Um, it, Paul had to go and offer a sacrifice and uh, demonstrate that he walked orderly and he also kept the law. Now, what did not occur is that they did not bind that law on the oh, Gentiles. Right, right, right. And, um, and so they didn't require the Gentiles to keep it during that time. But and, and the whole point of that, according to Acts 15, was to demonstrate to the Jews how the Jews would eventually be saved. In other words, they would be saved just like the Gentiles mm -hmm. without the law. So they didn't have to keep Torah. Um, Gentiles didn't. And the Jews were going to learn how to be saved by grace apart from the deeds of Torah. And that's that's what Acts 15 teaches. And when you look at the, the name Christian, it's very interesting. If you go to Acts 26, um, and verse... Okay, it, it cut off for a second. Now it's back on. Okay. All right. If you go to Acts, the first occurrence is in Acts chapter 11. And it wasn't until God brought the Gentiles in that the name Christian was used. Okay. okay? Which demonstrated the unity in the body of Christ between Jew and Gentile. But anyway, in the 11th chapter of Acts, in verse 26, it says, And when they had found him, he brought him to Antioch, so it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. All right, nothing derogatory said about that at this point. Then in, in chapter 26, now here's what's interesting. When you look at it in chapter 26, it says, um, this is when Paul is teaching King Agrippa. Uh -huh. So look at what he says. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? Now think about that question. That will verse we're on. That's 27. All right, 27. So what's the question? Do you believe the prophets? Do you believe the prophets? And then what does Paul say? I know that you do what? Believe. Are you with me? Yep. Acts 26, 27. All right. So the question is, do you believe the prophets? Right. And then Paul says, I know that you do believe. Verse 28 says, then Agrippa said to Paul, <laughs> you almost persuaded me to be a what? Christian. Christian. <laughs> now, what is Paul talking about? Believing what? Believing in Christ, which was the, with the, um, 
the prophets believing the prophets. Right, what the prophets all right saying. so apparently there's something in the prophets right that leads to a person understanding they should be a christian and would the king call himself something derogatory no <laughs> <laughs> no all right and then look at what paul said i would to god that not only you right but also all who hear me today might become both almost. Mm -hmm. Now, what is what was the almost that he talked about? Almost a Christian. Almost a Christian. Becoming a, a Christian. Christian right. Almost being swayed. He says, I don't want you to be almost, but what? All together. Such. Such as I, I am, am, except for these what? Except for these chains. All right. So, so then, go so, ahead. So Paul called himself something derogatory. So Paul was like, yes, I am a derogatory name. Right. No, I, I think Paul would have did that. I think right. they embraced the, 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 the Christian. Christian. All right, now go to 1 Peter, Peter chapter 4. Yeah, Peter 4, 16. Peter 4, 1 Peter 4, 15 and 16. Oh, 15 and 16. Yes. And depending on what translation you have, some of them. All right. Now watch. Let's read verse um, 14. Now, there were some reproaching them, mm -hmm. but they were reproaching them because they were Christians, period. Okay. Okay. If you are reproached for the what? For the name of Christ. Name of Christ. Uh -huh. Blessed are you. For the spirit of what? Glory uh -huh. and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is what? Blessed. Blasphemed. But on your part. He is what? Glorified. Glorified. Mm -hmm. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers how? As a Christian. As a Christian. As a Christian let him not be ashamed, but let him do what? Glorify God. Glorify God in this matter. In this matter. Some translation will say in this name. Mm. So wait a minute. <laughs> God can be glorified right. in the name Christian. Right. And that goes all the way back to Isaiah what, 65, 15, I think it is. Yep. <laughs> all right. Now, I'm at there is an illusion. Can I look that up real fast? Isaiah 65. Yeah, yeah. See what he, what it yeah. Is. I, I don't necessarily think that that is particularly referring to the name Christian, but, I mean, it's, it, is, it is a part of the new covenant. Well, so from that right perspective, here. yeah. It said Isaiah 65, 15. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just want to see what it says. Now, while you're in Isaiah 65, we can look at some other stuff. And if you shall leave your name as a curse to my children, for the Lord God will slay you and call his servants by another name. Yeah, now that's a good text. Yeah. That's... Because that text says Israel would be slain. Right, you know? right. You shall leave your name as a curse to my chosen. Mm -hmm. For the Lord God will slay you and call his servants by another name. All right. Mm. That, that's interesting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what the new that's what the Israelites was called. Christians, yep. right? Yep. I will correlate unless uh is there something else to correlate that with besides that? Well, it is. Okay. Um uh if you go to Revelation chapter three, I think it is. Um sorry, I am learning it right now myself, so and I want to say about verse, uh, let me see, is it is it three or is it two? Let's see. Let's go to three. Yeah. All right. Verse 12. He who, he who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him, what? The name of my the God. The name of my God and the okay. name of the city of my God. The new, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. Okay. So I think the name is the New Jerusalem. Okay. But the New Jerusalem is a covenantal term, right, right, and that right. embodies everything that is found in Christ. And then the Christians will be the ones who go through it. The Christians will be the ones who go yes. through it. Yes, yes. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. I got you. So it all makes sense. Okay, it makes sense. That's what Revelation was, what, 3-3 said? 3-12. 3-12, yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Right after right after the three nine when he's talking about the, the uh, 
What they say in two nine three nine? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. With the synagogue. Yeah, yeah they were called the synagogue yeah. of Satan, but those yeah. who were in the temple of God, right, right, they right. were going to be called the, um, the new Christian. <clears throat> All right. So you have this new Exodus. Let's see. All right. Yeah. So now the timeline. Oh. People in Antioch. I mean, uh, wh- where is the derogatory statement? There? <laughs> I, don't know. I haven't read. Right, I'm going to read all of it. The people in Antioch were Israelites. Paul was talking to the Israelites that were following heathen customs. Where is that? <laughs> I, don't know. I mean, give me the give me the verse <laughs> that what, says that. In Antioch, I guess he's saying that's what's going on. I don't. I don't know what. what you, I don't know. No, that, I, I don't know. Oh. Let me go back again. Let's yeah, what, go back. It's from what you just read. He said that's what was going on. This is Paul. Was okay, what I'm asking is the verse, the proof. I'm asking for the verse that says that. Okay. Okay. Well, he got a verse down here. Okay. All right. It says, "Hold on." The timeline before the name Christian became popular around the land, the name became accepted when they were saying it all the time. That's nowhere in the Bible. All right. Run, bid Israel. I've been sliced. Oh man, stop! I gave you my number. You can call in, Raven, anytime you want to. All right, Romans eleven. I mean Acts eleven twenty six. And when he had found them, he brought him into Antioch. And it came to pass that the, that a whole year they assembled themselves in the church and taught more people. And the disciple was called Christians first in Antioch. Okay. How's that derogatory? I don't see anywhere where it says it's derogatory. Oh, he said the disciples never called themselves Christians. Well, okay. Let's say they didn't call themselves Christians in Antioch. Now, um, if you take all the information that we just gave you, and that is from uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, where he says they could glorify God in that name. Um, So where is the derogatory statement? I guess he's saying because they didn't refer to themselves as Christians. Well, they called okay. themselves the way. Right. Um, they called themselves saints. They called themselves sons of God, et cetera, et cetera. Well, well can we walk through it real fast, Mr. Bell? What's that? Just, can we just walk through the picture real fast? I know you say you like picture and stuff. Can we walk through the picture real fast? Okay. All right, let's, let's just walk through it. All right. We see people mm-hmm. in our community, right? Word. We just walk through it back then. And they're teaching something different from what we're from what we've been taught, right? Mm -hmm. So by human nature, we will label them something different than what we are. Because people say, What is that that they're teaching? Well, that's that so and so doctrine. Right. That's what that is. The I mean the, the, the disciples wouldn't have not came over there. Saying, hey, we're teaching, we, we are Christians, <laughs> and we're making this name up, and we're coining this name of what we're doing. Right. They would their point wasn't their point was to uh, open up the people's eyes. And people are just doing what they do with mankind. It, it was just human nature. They put a label on stuff. So Christians, Christianity was actually a label. And in fact, in Greek, what is it in Greek anyway? What? Um it's Chris Christianos or something like that. Yes. So it's 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 it has the name Christ in it, and it's it's um, an adjective. Right. So uh, you know it's it's basically Christian in the Greek. Right. Right. Okay. 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 Um, the text I was looking at. Now, some even use James two seven along with that as well. It says, "Do not." Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? Okay. Okay. So, um, so, and it was called Christian. Yes. So if you say they, and, and that we saw where some of them blaspheme the name, right? Yes. So uh, that's what first Peter said. And then we saw, yeah, we saw, we saw it in Peter and we saw, well, you just pulled it up. Yeah. And then Mr. Uh, Bell, you pulled enough scripture for that. I know. Yeah. I know. But I'm going to, I'm going to reemphasize this one, one more time. I, I like this one. And, Acts 26. Okay. <laughs> King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. Now, why would Paul be persuading him to become something derogatory? Right. <laughs> from, 
from the prophets. Right. But to a king, what would have been the penalty for that back then? Yeah. Rome being the high power. Now, wait a minute. And then Paul what the, said, What would have been the penalty for that? Right. I would to God that not only you, but also all that hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. Now, Paul was there persuading the man to become a Christian. So, you know, what you're saying just doesn't make any it, sense. It won't pan out. No, no. I mean, they were not teaching anything different. They were magnifying the laws of God so it can be better understood. My, my, my brother. <laughs> well, then, if, that, if that's what they were teaching, then the laws of God were telling them to persuade others to become a Christian. Well, he said they weren't teaching anything different. They were teaching the laws of God. I thought they was teaching the, the gospel. They were, but I, I was just responding based on his comment. But, but, but me too, but me too. Um, and while they were speaking the gospel, what did Christ, in fact, can you, can you show us where Christ told them to go preach? What exactly he told them to preach? Um, it's here somewhere. He said, uh, go preach baptism and all that stuff, right? Well, Matthew, Mark, Mark, um, 16, 15 and 16, go therefore and teach the gospel to all the world. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. These signs shall follow those who believe in my name shall they cast out demons and they shall. Well, you got it right there. So, (laughs) so he didn't say anything right there about the Torah. No. No. <laughs> so they was in fact teaching something different from what the Pharisees was teaching. Yeah. Yeah. Uh well the Phar- yeah, particularly they were teaching something different than the Pharisees were teaching. Right. But it's important to understand also that the new covenant, as we say, was prophesied in the old, right? Right, right. So they were teaching the things of the new covenant. Right. You know, if they're going to teach the same thing, then they're teaching the old covenant. Right. Okay. So they were teaching the things that were of the new covenant, but that was prophesied. Right. And right, that's right, why when right. they were trying, see, that was the whole point of the Jews. They were trying to say, y'all teaching something different. They charged Paul with that when they had him on trial, Acts 24 and verse uh, 13 through 15. And Paul said they couldn't prove it. Right. That he was teaching something contrary to the law. Now, we just read from that text in Acts 26 that Paul was persuading him to believe the prophets and therefore to become a Christian. Right. So these guys are here saying that that's contrary to the law. Right. Paul said, I taught nothing other than those things that Moses and the prophets said would come. So it must have been a part of the law and the prophets to persuade them to become that. So that was teaching what what Moses now was prophesying. Exactly. Exactly. And what they try to do today, they try to teach what Moses got. Yes. Mm. They're not teaching the, the full understanding. understanding of it. They're just stuck on what Moses got. Right. right. They're stuck in the realm of the flesh. Yes. That's, 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 it. that's what it is. Okay. And so in verse 13 of chapter 24, he says, Nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me, but this I confess to you that according to the way which they call a sect, mm-hmm. so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law the and prophet. in the prophets. That's it. All right. So Paul says they couldn't prove that. He says they can't prove things of which they now accuse me. And then he he spoke specifically of the resurrection that was about to take place. I have hope in God, which they themselves. See, there was but one hope. Now, I want you to think about this. Uh There is but one hope in the Bible. Right. Now, let's look at what Paul says the hope is. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept. So whatever Paul's hope was, this is what they had. Right. Now tell me if the Jews living in the first century had the hope of getting out of the transatlantic slave trade. <laughs> Not at all. Not Did they? At all. they ain't Not got nothing about it. <laughs> there was no transatlantic slave trade. So how could that have been their hope? Right. And so, and then in Acts 28, 20, he says, For the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. Yeah. And their hope was to put on the incorruptible, right? That's right. So he says, um, and he quotes Daniel. So if the transatlantic slave trade in the Bible, it ought to be in Daniel chapter it 12. It should be in Daniel. And it's not. It should. That's my go-to. It mm-hmm. should be in Daniel. Yeah. 
anything that you say in the Bible right. should be found in Daniel when you try to say it's our future. Mm -hmm. You should find it in Daniel. Uh, here's another text. In verse 20, in chapter 26, same chapter we had before. Verse 22. He says, therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand, witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people or the Judeans and to Said, the read, Gentiles. He said, read, he said, read Isaiah 56 with John. Oh, that's John. Yeah. Uh, it's John 1, 56 uh, and 5. Well, Isaiah, Isaiah, no, Isaiah 26, Acts 26, 26, 26 uh, uh, verses 22 yeah. and 23. Okay, I got it. All right. So in 56 and 5. Even to them I will give in my house and within my wall a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. All right. So who is the, the everlasting name? I still think it has to do with you know, oh, the new Jerusalem, et cetera, because it is a, uh, a covenant and a world without end. But if you want to, you know, I mean, Christian is a part of that. Right, so, right, right. you know, it's it's like a part of, of that entire process. But but uh, no, the gospel, I mean, I'm not, I'm not cutting you off. Just, no, 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 I go ahead. Go ahead. We're that, just talking. Wait, hold on. But that also shows, too, that because uh, the sons and daughters at that time were uh, Israel. Jew, yeah, were Israel. And so if he's giving these people a better name than them, <laughs> then it tells you. That has some. That's not just Israel. Right. It's not Israel. Yeah. It's something better. Than yeah, it's something better. Yeah. Than and if you read the next verse, you'll see that he's talking. You know, beyond yeah. that. Right. The gospel was only the good news, only for the Israelite. Now you only got to respond to it because he actually explained it to himself, right. not knowing that he's explaining it right. to himself. <laughs> All right. The gospel was only the good news, only for the Israelite. The other nations can hear in and cleave. Okay, that by itself. That's the, right. that, that by itself shows you <laughs> that the gospel wasn't for only right. the Israelites. They show you that they don't understand what they be putting out. <laughs> okay, so if you can clean to it, what does that mean, buddy? <laughs> so thank you. We agree. We agree. Now I don't know about the other stuff. The phrases. Oh, sorry. It's supposed to be Pharisees. The Pharisees mm -hmm. were teaching the laws. So once they cling to it, what can they do? <laughs> The, the Pharisees were teaching the laws, but keeping the northern kingdom out and not paying attention to the signs and wonders of God. What? Is that found in the scripture, Mr. Bell? You might can help me out. That they were keeping them out. Yeah, the northern kingdom out. Well, I mean, there was some... Um, yeah, some dissension going on yeah. between them because they considered them really uh, as uh, Gentiles for the most part, you know, um, and and that's what the Bible says of them in, in he uh, not Hebrews, but in um, Amos 8 and verse 8, is, no, no, Hosea 8 and verse 8, that Ephraim has been swallowed up by the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And so in essence, that's what they were uh, because they've been cut off from God. Well, was the northern kingdom keeping them out? Oh, was or, or was God? I mean, was the was the Pharisees keeping the Northern Kingdom out, or was God at that point keeping the? Northern no, it, kingdom it, out? Good, good point. Uh, it was God because God says, "You are not my people; I will not be your God." Right. So He's the one who cut them off to begin with. Right. As a matter of fact, if you look at the them, right? if you look at the history if you look at the history of the Pharisees, the Pharisees started. Way after the Assyrian captivity, yes. So they weren't even existing prior to that time. Did they start like in the Maccabean era? Or somewhere somewhere like yeah. in that area, yeah. yeah, in that era. How many captivities they went through? Seven or six or something? I like think they went through seven. If you seven. want to call Egyptian a captivity, which was the first one, it might be six. Egyptian, then you got uh, Assyrian, Syria. you got Babylonian, Babylonian. then you Persian. got Persian, then you got the Greek, then you got the Romans. Romans. Mm -hmm. So six, so six yeah. Okay. So, um, somebody said seven. 
So he they, they, they use America for seven. Oh, <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> that makes sense. So completion right there. Yeah. All right, so the gospel was getting in. Right. Well, what about those who went to <laughs> Brazil? I mean, they don't care about those. <laughs> they don't care I about know. Them. What about the ones that went to South America? There were more slaves in Brazil <laughs> than in America. They don't care about those. Those phrases were teaching the law, the Pharisees were teaching the laws, but keeping them and were not paying attention to the signs and wonders of God. All right. Oh, yeah, let's keep going. Okay, so we, you know, we were talking about covenant, and um, so there's your covenant part the right. difference between the flesh and the spirit. The last thing I was going to talk about, uh, or at least the last point I was going to make with that, was the difference between the natural man and the pneumatic cost man. So you got the suki cost man. And you have the pneumaticos man. Okay. And the distinction between those two is that one has received the spirit, the other did not. And you can see that in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse, um, I think it's 14 maybe. Um, so in verse 13, he says, these things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, mm -hmm. for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually right. discerned. Right. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. Mm -hmm. Most people attack people who teach the spiritual things according to the scriptures right. because right. they understand them. Their minds are still in the realm of the flesh. And so he says, uh, and, and, and the distinction here is... Um, the natural man is the man who does not receive the things of the spirit of God. Now, God didn't even give the spirit to the natural man. That's Galatians chapter three. He asked them, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was evidently set forth among you or clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law? or by the hearing of faith. Those right. are two different covenants. One is the covenant of faith. The other one is the covenant of the law. Mm -hmm. And the it's a rhetorical question, and the implied answer is no, or, or is we received it by faith, not by the law. Mm -hmm. Okay? So the Holy Spirit was not poured out upon those who were under Torah, under the law, in terms of those who were rejecting the Messiah. Because right. remember, this was a gift that the Messiah poured out right. on believers. And so those under Torah did not receive it right. uh, if they were simply trying to follow Torah alone, but did not accept the Messiah. And so he says um, in verse three, are you so foolish having begun where? In the, the spirit. spirit. That's the covenant into which they are operating. Mm -hmm. Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by so what? Go back into the by the works of the law. The question is no. So go back to that law. <laughs> All right. Are you, but look at what he said. Look at the language. Are you now made perfect by the what? Look at the word in there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Galatians 3 and verse 3 is what we started out talking about. Galatians 3? Yes. Got me one second. I'm almost there. My, my mind was over here formulating something. Yeah, I'm gonna bring up to you in a second. Galatians three and three. Mm -hmm. Let's get the right here. Okay. And it says, and I quote from the Bible: "Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh?" So you see, that's the distinction between the two covenants. Right. Remember, we started off in John, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, nor, I mean, but of God. So those who were of the flesh were those of the old covenant. Those who were of the spirit were those who were of the new covenant. Get Romans 8 and verse 8 and 9 for me and read that one. Romans 8, 8 and 9. Mm-hmm. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. All right, look at that. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, if you make that your natural biology, 
Right. It would mean none of us can please God. Right. Nobody who is on this earth could please God. Not even Christ. That's right. That's telling you this is not a reference to your physical flesh. This is the covenant in which you are trying to serve God. The old covenant was the covenant of the flesh because it depended on man to keep it perfectly in order to receive the blessings of the old covenant. Right. And man couldn't do that. And that's why he says those who are in the flesh cannot please God. All right. But you are not in the flesh. You are not in the flesh. He wasn't telling those people that they didn't have a physical body. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were not in the old covenant of the flesh. They were not in that realm because they died to it and came out of it. But, All right? but in the spirit. But in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. All right. See, there it is. That's the spirit of God. Mm -hmm. So if the spirit of God dwelled in them, they were in the spirit. Right. And the spirit of and those in the spirit are the ones who have the spirit of God. All right, the spirit of God dwelled in them. Yes. The new covenant was to dwell in them. Correct. The kingdom was supposed to be in them. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Even yeah. Christ himself was to <laughs> dwell yeah, in yeah, them. Yeah, that's it. Amen. That's it. I mean, Amen. And, now wait a minute. Wait, get, get Colossians 1 and 27. Get Colossians 1 and 27. Colossians 1. Yes. 27 says. To, to them, God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which Christ is, well, sorry, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So what was their hope? Christ the transatlantic slave trade? <laughs> <laughs> no, it says the hope, their hope was Christ in you. Now that can't be. Christ being physically inside of us, right? That's that's a spiritual uh, blessing for Christ to live within us, mm -hmm. and so we're in Him, and He is in us. That was the hope, the one hope of glory. There is no other hope, right? 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 Okay. And um, so He says, "Have you suffered so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain, therefore He who supplies the Spirit to you." and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So that was the distinction. That's why those who said they were Jews and were not could be easily determined because they did not have the spirit of God in them. Right. And therefore they could not please God. All right. So That's why, see, with, with the preaching of the gospel, remember uh -huh. that we just covered in Romans, I mean, in, uh, in Mark 16, 16, when he says, go into all the world, preach the gospel to all the creation. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who does not believe shall be condemned. Now watch. And these signs shall follow those who believe. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. In my name, they shall cast out demons Amen. and, yes, and do those things. Yes, yeah. And take up serpents, drink poison, and speak in tongues, etc. <laughs> so those were the gifts given to the believers. I got so much stuff formulated right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So much stuff. So, Mr. Brown, that's just like the second, uh, the first Exodus, you know, 40 years, and in, in uh, Moses was showing all the signs for 40 years. Second Exodus, Jesus and the uh, apostles, they were doing signs for. And that's all and according to people, prophecy. Yeah, they're all according to prophecy. And even the people that didn't follow, that weren't walking with them, because remember, uh, the apostles said, uh, Jesus, we see somebody. Uh, uh, what do you say? We see somebody casting out demons or something like that. And who is not name. following with us? Yeah, yeah. he said. Who are, yeah, he said they're not following with us. And Jesus said, "Well, some of them not be able to bless me, the name or something like that. If or they can't deny it or something like that. What do you, What do you say? Right, I can't remember the exact yeah. statement, but it said, um, "How can those anybody that's with us can be against us?" Or he said yeah, something he, like that, that was one of the statements he made. Yeah. He says, "He who is not with us, I mean, is not against us, is with us." And then he also said, the how could they lightly sign. speak evil of me right. uh, in some, you know. Let me pull it up. Yeah, but anyway, that's that's part of it. And, and I want to formulate all these real fast. I want to mm -hmm. formulate all Go these. Ahead. All right, now, so now, first thing first, uh, I'm going to answer to Brother Ron. Brother Ron, this is this was way past only Israel only because King Agrippa was not an Israelite that I know of. I'm pretty sure he was a Roman. And he said that a Paul, he said he told Paul, You're trying to make me a Christian. Mm -hmm. And Paul said, I wish I would be a Christian. So if this was only for the Israelites, 
that whole conversation would never happen for Paul. Correct. So now that's one thing that's out the out the window. Second thing, the new covenant now that I'm going to make with the house of Israel and Judah. This covenant was for the spiritual Israelites, mm -hmm. the, not the national, right. but the spiritual ones. Now, the mm -hmm. spiritual Israelite could be some of the national ones, yeah. which it was, True. but this was a spiritual covenant. Right. So this ain't a, a, a national thing either. Mm -hmm. right, that's two. This is the third one. So Luke 21, 24. Everybody that got took into captivity mm -hmm. was Torah followers. Yep. Only to a fellow. Only, only to a, But now, the two witnesses in Revelation. I don't see them. Now I might be wrong. I don't see them being Christians because they got stuck in the temple with the siege. So, how could they be stuck in the temple with the siege? And still be followers of Christ. I think he used. Or did he use them to fulfill some of the old testament? I think stuff. he used Torah people to fulfill that. Right. That's what I think. Now go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I don't have a comment on that. Right, let's, let's formulate it here real fast. Let's formulate it real fast. Let's, let's formulate it. <laughs> I'm not gonna try to answer something I don't know. The answer to. All right, so this is Revelation 11. I just want to read it real fast. Mm -hmm. Revelation 11 and 2. It says, uh, well, we know what it wanted to, but 2. It says, but leave out the court. Uh, well, I'm always read 1. Then I was given a read like unto a measuring rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. Mm -hmm. So the people who worship there in the altar, right? Right. These were people following the Torah. Okay, keep going. All right, verse 2. But leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. And they would tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. Right? So this is doing the destruction of the temple, right? Right. So now wait a minute. All right, let's go then. Let's formulate it. All right. Okay. So are you saying that verse one refers to the people who were left out and punished? Yeah, when, when verse one, the people worshiping inside of the temple, would they not be the ones following Torah? Well, he says, I was given a read like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, okay. the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it for it has been given to the Gentiles and they will tread the Holy city underfoot for 40 and two months. Right. So, so let's, let's go. Well, maybe you can look at it that way. And, and I'm not going to say that you can't at this point, well, just give me, give me your, uh, but your, your my understanding of it was okay. that the reason it was measured was to measure off those who were being preserved. Okay. And those who are not being preserved are indicated in the next verse that are going to be destroyed. Okay. So the court that is without the temple. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's a there's sort of a play on on this concept because you got the spiritual sort of connected in here, you know, because this is vision, this is apocalyptic right, language. Right. Let me let's let's go to Ezekiel eight and see if it gives us any um, All right. Any help with understanding that? Or it might be chapter nine. Yes. Yeah. Okay. If you go to Ezekiel nine and start in verse three, um, all right. He says, Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed with linen, who had the uh, writer's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry mm -hmm. over all the abominations that are done within it. Right. So who is he marking here? See, th these people are the ones who who hate with the people destroy, going against the law. Yeah. yeah. So they hate the abominations right, that are right. being done. Right. So the mark upon them is a mark 
to preserve them, right, to right. seal them as his people. And then he says, to the others, he said in my hearing, go after him through the city and do what? Kill. And kill, do not let your eye spare, nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young uh, men, maidens and little children and women, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark and begin with my sanctuary. See, there is the temple again. Uh -huh. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. And he said, defile the temple and fill the courts with slain. Go out, and they went out and killed in the city. So I think this is the type of what we have in Revelation right, 11, right. where um, he is speaking. And, and so this would be the preservation of the remnant okay. who were Israel. Okay. okay, But he's preserving them because they have been marked or sealed with the spirit right. to preserve them from destruction. Okay, And the rest would be the ones who were subject to being killed. Okay. And that's the court that is without the temple. Okay. Now, that's the way I understand Well, can I ask you something now? Yes. All right. So now, in Revelation 11, I mean 7, right? Uh-huh. They had been sealed. Yes. And they was to flee into the mountains. Mm -hmm. All right. So, in, in 11, we don't have them, we don't have nobody fleeing. Right. So, does that mean that the fleeing in the mountain has already occurred? Um... At the now, I, might be, I might be digging too well, deep. No, 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 no. I understand. I might be digging too deep. <laughs> I understand where you're going. I might be digging too deep. If this is the time where he says, leave out the court which is outside the temple, do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the city underfoot 40 in two months. Right. We know that they would have fled sometime either prior to or very shortly thereafter the time that the siege began. Right. Because if you know the, right, you know, right, and right, I know right, you know right, the history yeah, as much as right. you study Josephus. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, Josephus expert. <laughs> there you go. So, uh, and we know that it was after they had started the siege right. and then they had this let up where the Christians were able to flee from right. the city. Right, 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 right. But it's all within that 42 months period, right? Right, right. So right. you're, I mean, you're you're right there on top of it in terms of what's happening. So if these two witnesses got killed inside the temple, though, mm -hmm. did any Christians get killed inside? Or would this be the persecution? Well, it would have to be the persecution. I okay. don't know. I don't okay. know any okay. of any Christians who got killed. During okay, okay. Y'all saw, hey, I like, I like mm -hmm. Revelation. So I formulate deep in it. So now, all right, I got you now. Okay, so so that would have to be either the persecution, because I actually have a, a idea who those two witnesses from Joseph. Okay, but but I just had to ask that. What did Joseph say? Uh, it was two people um, that was going through there trying to get peace from mm -hmm. from. Um, the I Israelites. think I remember the two men that you're talking about. One of them was Jesus or somebody. I don't mm -hmm. know the other guy's name, but as soon as the people killed them. And as soon as the second one died, that's when the war came. Mm -hmm. As soon as they died, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's why, and that's what Josephus said. He said that he thinks so the war the, came because they were mad that they he killed well, the second one. Or? Yeah, Josephus said he thinked the war seemed like it came right because after they, were they killed the righteous second one. Right, right. Yeah. He said he think that's what caused the war. God mm -hmm. was being upset. But Josephus, imagine if Josephus was a Christian. Yeah. How he would have just connected it all in there. But right. you know what? I think he has more credibility not being one. Right, right, right. <laughs> because right. now you got a person who can be more objective, right. or not that a Christian wouldn't be, right. but the point is, because he was not a Christian and reported these things, mm -hmm. that gives, to me, more weight. Right. right. To, He's not biased. Yeah, yeah, yeah because yeah. everybody else would be saying, well, you know, a Christian would say that. Right, right, right. right, right and right, right. Uh, so I think it's That's even more true. important <laughs> that true. he's not. Sorry, y'all. We, we went on our little rant. Okay, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see through a glass dark, uh, through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. All right, it's a very good text. Um, if you. Is this a prophesying in part thing? Uh huh. I'm going to show you how they use this. Okay, go ahead. They try to say that everything couldn't have been fulfilled back then because they only knew things in part so they do not everything that you're reading is just part of the prophecy that's how they use that meaning that the other part happened in 1619 
Is that kind of what they mean? Well, it still ain't happening yet. They still waiting on that. That, that says the future is coming. There's right, still some stuff right. that's left okay. because only part of it has left. Okay. okay, well, here's the deal. In 1 Corinthians 13, first of all, uh, that context doesn't begin in chapter 13. It begins in chapter 1. All right. So if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and look at what it says, you'll find this pattern throughout the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 1, 4 through, 4 through 8. 1 Corinthians 1, 4 through 8 yeah. says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by G Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him, in all utterance, in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you may come short, so that you come short in no gift eagerly, waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, very good. Okay, so the context here is the gifts that were given, just like we were reading in Mark 16, 17 and following. So notice that he says, you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. This is utterance by means of miraculous uh, inspiration. Okay. In other words, they were able to speak the word of God. They didn't have a New Testament. Right, right, you know? right. So they were able to speak the word of God. They could interpret tongues. They could prophesy, etc. All these were miraculous gifts. And God gave them the miraculous gifts to confirm his word, just like he gave it to Moses. Uh -huh. You know, If they don't believe you, then what do I do, God? He says, okay, you got a rod, throw that down, etc. Right, pick right. it up, put your hand, etc. So he gave them those signs uh -huh. so that Moses would have credibility before Israel and they would believe the testimony that he was giving on behalf of God. So that's what they're saying, that you were enriched in everything by him, in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. All right. So that word confirm is from the Greek term babios, and it means to confirm through these miraculous gifts. Then he says, so that you come short in no gift. You see how he's talking about the gifts? Yes, sir eagerly waiting now the word eagerly is another important word that you should study because it carries the idea of someone um looking forward to something with their neck stretched out it's like you're running a race and you know how the the runners when they get to the finish line they <laughs> yeah. lean forward to yeah. lean over the you know that's the idea they're so close that they're uh, trying to get that last push out to win that race so eagerly waiting for the coming of the lord meant and implied that the coming of the Lord was very soon to occur. And so he says that you may be blameless in the, oh, I'm sorry, uh, waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, which means they would have those miracles uh, all the way to yeah, what? The time of to the, the end. end. Right. It doesn't say the end of time. Yeah. It says until the end. Right. So that's the time of the end that Daniel talked about. But also important in the text is to understand the word you. These were specifically the Corinthians yeah. in the first century. Right. He's not talking to us as having these gifts. Right. Okay. And so the testimony was confirmed in them, uh -huh. and they had the miracles to back it up. Right. All right. And so this would continue until the end. And the end here is the same end of Matthew 24, 13, and 14, where it says, but he who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And it says, this gospel of the kingdom must be preached as a witness in all the inhabited earth to all the nations, and then the yeah, end cool. would come, all right? And all of that would take place within that generation, right. before that generation passed away. So that's why it says, in order that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, once you have that background, then you can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And in 1 Corinthians 13, he gives you an analogy of a child compared to a full-grown man mm -hmm. yes the, if you look up the word child in the text it is the greek word nepios and so it means an underaged person if the end is the time of the inheritance which it is uh -huh. 
you don't give an inheritance to an underage person. child. Right, right, right. They have to become legally of it or of legal age. So the church in the beginning, starting on Pentecost, began as an infant and then grew through adolescence, if you please, and eventually would become an adult at the right. time of the end. And that's when the inheritance would be received. So while they're going through the growing stage, they are given these miracles. Yes, sir. That's like wonder bread. You know, it builds the body 12 ways. <laughs> so the miracles were building up the body of Christ so that it could become full grown, move from the state of being a child to the state of being full grown. Now, one of the things that I, that I like to do here, and I did this in, in, in my book. I had that book on the, where was that book? I saw that book tonight. It was, it was my, I probably put it up. But uh, the book that I wrote on, um, da -da 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 -da, what's the name of it? Um, Living in Eternity. Okay. But the point is, I would recommend, and let me, let me see if I can draw it out for you. Um, I might can do this on the screen. Let me, let me try it. I might can do this. Uh, let's see, where do I want to go? I want to go here. All right. And then where is that, uh, screen thing here? Okay. Let's go share. And that's not what I want to share. Let's see. I don't want to share that. Where is the where is the screen thing? Let's see. Here's the chat box. I don't want the chat box. Is it Zoom right here? Is yeah, this Zoom? is Zoom. Okay. Um, there's a screen that you can use, or you can write on it. And I'm trying to find it. It's not it. Mm, that's not it. All right, can't find it. Um, hmm. Can you just do it in regular paint? Well, I could, but let's you know, see. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to do it as simple as I possibly can, but I don't see what I'm looking for. Uh, what's what's here? Basic advanced look window. I want an iPad. All right, well, I can't do it because I can't pull up that screen that allows me to uh, to draw on it. All right, but the point is, if you were to draw a straight line down the center of your page, let's just get out of there. All right, so if you were to, to draw a line down the center of your page, uh, I should have another one's pad somewhere. Pull that one up for me. All right, just a simple line like like that. Where's the camera? All right, there we go. You can see that line right down the center. Now, and you look at the text, and it says, um, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. So on one side of the line, I'm going to put part. And we know that stands for knowing and prophesying in part. So I'll just put K and P, all right? And then it says, but when that which is perfect has come. So the opposite of that would be perfect. Is that making sense to everybody? It makes sense to me. All right. Because that's what they were waiting for. They had the part. They were waiting for the perfect. All right. And then he says, um, when that perfect arrives, the part is done away. Then he says, um, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I had thought. Like a child. Uh, understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man. So now we got the child over here where it's a part, and then we have the man on the other side, okay? And then next, he says he put away the childish things. And he says, now we see in a mirror, dimly or darkly. So that's the mirror over here where we have the part. And then on the other side, we have face to face, all right? So the time of, now I want to put another scripture together with this. And that is Ephesians chapter 4. So if you go to Ephesians 4, which discusses the very same thing. Let me get there. 
All right, starting in verse, uh, let's, let's go to verse 11. All right, start at, let's start at verse 11. All right, let me just put this up here so you can kind of see what I got. and see if I can show it. Yeah. So there you go. You got the part here and the knowledge and the prophesying in part, the time that they are a child, and then this is the time they're looking through the mirror. What they were hoping to do was come to the perfect and the full-grown state as a man, as opposed to a child. And when they become the man, that's when they see face to face. Okay. Now you might have opinions about what face to face means, but contextually and, and uh, textually face to face simply means the time that they become a full grown man and they reach the state of the perfect. All right. So now if we go to Ephesians four, you can keep that up, you know, keep hold of that um, as long as they can see it. So now if you go to Ephesians 4, start at verse 11, he's talking about the gifts again. And he said, and because in verse 8, he says, therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. So in verse 11, it tells you what gifts he gave. He gave him and he himself gave some to be apostles. That was a gift. All right. All right. All right? Some prophets. That was a gift. Some evangelists. That was a gift. Some pastors and teachers, that was a gift because they all, all of these are gifts of teaching and inspiration and knowledge. Amen. All right. And so he says, for the equipping of the saints. All right. So to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The word edify means to build up till we all come to the unity of the faith. So all of those things were given in terms of their miraculous uh, support. Just like in Corinthians, he says, in, you were enriched in all utterance and knowledge in 1 Corinthians 1. But he says, till we come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a what? Perfect. A perfect man. So there's the same thing. It's the same words that's used in 1 Corinthians 13. All right. Mm -hmm. all right. The word perfect is from the term telos, and it means to come to a state of maturity. All right. And uh, to the measure of the stature of what? the fullness of Christ. Why? Verse 14, that we no longer be what? Children. Children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, um, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things who is the head, which is Christ. So those gifts were given until the time of the end so that they could become the perfect man. And when they became the perfect man, that's when they would see face to face. Now, what time was that? We he told us in chapter one that it was the coming of Christ. Right, right. If you read Micah 7, 15, he says it would be according to the days of their coming out of Egypt. Okay. Yes. okay. How long was that? 40 years. 40 years. So it would take them 40 years to get to that state called face to face when they would be the perfect man. So is that the same? I will plead them face to face in the wilderness. Is that the same thing? Um, sort of. I'm, it, it depends on the context. Okay. I'd have to see the context. Okay. Um, but face to face generally in the Old Testament scriptures is a reference to resurrection coming to the state of maturity, et cetera. There are many passages that will establish that in the Old Testament. Okay. You have to you have to look them up and do the research. Okay. Um, what was the next? So that was, that was one. Micah 7, 15 tells them, and according to the days of your coming out of Egypt, I will show what? Marvelous things or yeah, wonder, signs, signs and wonders, wonders et cetera. Right. Now, that's 40 years. So this time to reach the maturity and the face-to-face was uh, this 40 year period. And because that happened in 70 AD, because the gifts were poured out on Pentecost, right? Mm -hmm. And the siege and destruction came in 70 AD. Mm -hmm. That was the coming of the Lord. There's the time you see face to face. Uh, it's not some physical seeing God. You can't see God face to face because he's a spirit, right? Mm -hmm. And um, But the only way you can see him is through those events. And so the end of the miracles would be one of the testimonies that 
they have now reached the state of face-to-face. -face. And that's where we are today. Those who are believers are in that state of the face-to-face -face presence with God. Um, I wanted to give just a couple of other uh, points on the termination of those gifts. Um, I know Ephesians 4 is one of them. 1 Corinthians 1, 7 is one of them. And um, I can't think of the other one at the moment. But that's, that's the idea, to go from the childhood state. And we are no longer in the childhood state. We're in the state of maturity, the state of being a full-grown man. That's why we don't lay hands on people and impart gifts to them. Now, I know you got a lot of people out there claiming they can do it. But trust me, it's not happening. Um, so if I get bit by a snake, I probably want to go to the doctor. You please go to the doctor. <laughs> if you drink we, some poison, please, <laughs> please. If you drink some poison, please call the toxic, you know, uh, whatever uh, center. I'll, I'll need to call my pastor. No, 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 no. Hey, no, you hey, no, hey, no, no, no. Let me, no. Let me read that scripture. Script I'll pray for you, but I'll pray that you get to the hospital as quickly hey, as you hey, possibly hey, can. Hey, hey. Here's that scripture from earlier. Okay. Uh, uh, right. Mark, Mark 9, 38 through 41. Yes. It said, now John answered him, saying, teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name. And we forbade him because he does not follow us. But Jesus said, do not forbid him, for no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is on our side. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, assuredly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Okay. Mm. So even people that weren't actually walking with them, but believe had the gifts too. Yeah people that um, they were doing it, however, in Christ's name. So apparently they had had some contact with Christ. Right, right, right. They just didn't, yeah, they just didn't said, hang out with the apostles. Every yeah. day all day like right. the, the disciples. Yes. Yeah. Pretty much the same thing. they clearly believe. That we all do. Mm -hmm. Right, right. We learn and we take it to our people. Exactly. Learn, right. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Mr. Bell, I think you didn't, you didn't pretty much kill everything that you needed to kill tonight. Besides... Uh, what is it? Efficiency... Two, 13 through 14. A wall between the Jews and Gentiles broken down all of one after the cross. That's correct, uh, John. Right. So, so now, a question before we mm -hmm. call it quiz, mm -hmm. can you hit that? Uh, because you're just going over a covenant eschatology, pretty much what we believe in and all that. Yeah, let me finish defining it because okay, I never okay, did okay, do that. Okay, okay, okay. So, now the covenant was the transition from the old covenant to the new covenant. And the reason it's called eschatology is because the old covenant was coming to an end. There is no end of the new covenant. So you can't have eschatology at the end of the new covenant. It is a covenant and we're, uh, without end, Ephesians 3 and 21. So you don't place your eschatology at the end of the new covenant. It goes at the end of the old covenant. And, uh, and that's what eschatology means. It means the study of last things. So the... Um, end of the old covenant and the inauguration of the covenant, which is what we have now. And there is no more eschatology for the new covenant. The only eschatology you can biblically talk about is what brought the old covenant to an end. Okay. All right, now go ahead. Uh, the last thing uh, for us, who they label as full predators, mm -hmm. could you go in uh, just for you know a second, however long you want to take for the Lewis guy? That we keep getting oh, Louis de Alcazar. Yes. Okay. People <laughs> attribute the preterist view to Louis de Alcazar, who was a Jesuit priest that lived around the 16th century, I think. Okay. All right. And they say that's where preterism comes from. No, it's not. Everything that we've just shown you tonight, we got out of the scriptures. Scripture. That was before Louis de Alcazar was even thought of. Right. Okay. But here's the other point about Louis de Alcazar for those who use it. Now, let me tell you the source of the first person who, who claims they use. Now, I'm not saying he's the first who did it because I'm sure some other people have, have pulled this before. But in talking to Hebrew Israelites, the person who claims to be the first person to mention Louis de Alcazar was Carl Albert. And he said that 
I believe, on a debate talk for you show or somewhere that this that he originated that idea that you know Louis de Alcazar. Now you have to decide if you if you're gonna trust Carl Albert's scholarship on that. He's a good guy. I like him. We're friends. <laughs> but um the people who use Louis de Alcazar apparently either do not understand the full preterist view or they have not read what the statements and facts are for Louis de Alcazar or both. Okay. Now I read what he believed. I am 100% convinced that he was not a full preterist. Okay. And, uh, and I made this point in the debate that I had with Captain Tazariak because he pulled Louis de Alcazar trying to say that this is where our doctrine came from. At the same time, it was Captain Desariac who was arguing that some, not all, of Matthew 24 was fulfilled in right. 70 AD. Right. You remember that because yes, you watched sir. that video five yes, times, sir. right? Yes, sir. He was saying, you know, the scripture says this, assured I say to you, Matthew 24, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place all. till all of them. Right. That's my position. Okay. That's what I teach. That's what I advocate. I don't change it, twist it or maneuver it any kind of way. I teach it just like it says. Okay. Now when Captain Desariac was going through the text, he said some of these things, and then he charged me with teaching the doctrine of Louis de Alcazar. Here's what Louis de Alcazar taught. And you can go look him up and read this for yourself what he taught was the partial preterist view if you take the book of revelation as fulfilled in 70 a.d and we have a lot of people who call themselves preterists who do that but they will tell you in a moment they are partial preterists they will deny being a full preterist they will vehemently deny being a full preterist. As a matter of fact, if you tell them you are a full preterist, they will not only deny, but they will run from you, okay? Because they do not even want to be associated with a full preterist. I've been talking to a guy now to try to get him to have, a, you know, allow us to debate on their platform. And we were having a good um, uh, cordial conversation. And I, he asked me the question. He says, you are a preterist, right? I said, yeah. He said, partial preterist. I said, no, I'm a full preterist. He said, what? <laughs> the conversation almost stopped right there. And I knew that he had a problem with having a full preterist on his show because, see, everybody thinks we are heretics. Right. Everybody. Everybody. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and he was having a problem with it. So I'm waiting on him. To because I told him, I said, okay, let's have a real solid debate. Let's take, you know, I said, I got some things going on. Let's schedule this down the road so we both have time to study and prepare like we, you know, want to and put on a real good debate because he has a good platform. And uh, when I told him, he said, why wait so long? He said, well, let's do it in two weeks. I said, okay, well, two, I'm, I said, I'm prepared. Let's do it in two weeks. And uh, that's been about a, almost a month ago now. <laughs> And it still hasn't come on. I'm not saying he won't do it. He may, and, and that's fine if he does. And I hope that he does, because I think, you know, a person of his caliber and the men that he has working with him would be good for a discussion. You know, it won't be a shout match. This will be a completely high plane intellectual discussion. All right. And it will be moderated. So uh, with time and everything. So this and it will be online. This will be a good platform. And I'm hoping that he will eventually do it. But they have such a problem with a full preterist that they don't even want to know people that they talk to us, I don't think, you know, that they communicate with us. And so all we get is, is a lot of times is negativity from them. However, the partial preterists, they consider themselves like, you know, people that you can talk to, people that you can associate with. And a lot of people who are partial preterists is that my phone? Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, that's the computer. 
This is Anton Josiah, who is the, I don't know, that's an uh, Israelite. Yeah, I know. Yes, sir. William Bell. Hey. What's shalom, up? Shalom, shalom. Shalom. Hey. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's around uh, eight around, around something, eight here in Kenya. Oh, you're in Kenya? Yes, sir. Oh, cool, it's cool. Bright, it's bright out there. <laughs> see if they can see that. Yeah. Shalom, brother. Shalom. Shalom, shalom. Yeah, what's happening? Yeah, this is my father. I'm working out now. Oh, yeah. Working out. Okay. Working out. Working out. Yeah. Yeah. Working out. 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 Working well, we, 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 we need to talk some. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, we can talk. Well, I was going to say we need to talk sometime. So maybe we can, you know, we can get on. We were just about to wrap up here. But uh, I'd like to talk to you. Okay. We can have some conversation sometime. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Like, uh, I, was, I was, you know, you can pray for me because uh, my... You know, no one knows what Yahweh does from beginning to end, but we do know when he does it, it's above and beyond what we can ask or think, right? Right. So, I'm, uh, July, in July, uh, this, this, this time, I don't know which way he's taking me. Is he going to bring me back to the U.S. or am I going to stay here in, in the motherland, right? How long have you been there? I've been there since 205. Okay. And uh, and so I was like, okay, Father, which way you want me to go? I'm going to knock on some doors, and he'll close where he don't want me to go. If I, I'm, you saw my, you seeing my uploads? Um, I haven't seen them. I've seen you around, but I haven't uh, noticed your uploads. Are you putting them on Facebook or YouTube? YouTube. Okay. And on, on, my, on my timeline, it's just all uploads on the timeline. Okay, all right. I'll check them out. Check, check those out right? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so I'm like, okay, Father, do, do I go back to you? I don't know. I don't know. You can pray about that where you want me. Uh, uh, and we'll see what happens, you know. <clears throat> I know you and you're, you're, you're also an elder with wisdom, knowledge, understanding. Uh, but, yeah. We can. I can call you later or some other time or whenever. What would be good for you? Yeah, tomorrow night will be good. I'll I'll, I'll be just chilling tomorrow night. Probably around tomorrow se- night is uh, Sunday here, uh, around seven or eight p.m. So you where are you? I'm in uh, Central Time in Memphis. Memphis, Tennessee. Correct. Okay. So seven. Is mm-hmm. that three hours uh, ahead of L.A.? Yeah. Uh, yes. Is it? It's two hours, two hours ahead of L.A. I think we're two there's a five-hour difference between us. Well, you're in Kenya. It might be more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm uh, 10 hours ahead of L.A., so then that would be eight hours then. Okay. So your, your seven would be... Uh, what time is it right now? Is it... What time is it there now? Well, right now it's... Uh, About eight or nine years. Yeah. I can't take this off. But this ain't like a uh, what's up, huh? Check out the time. I think it's like <laughs> tell me your time and then I'll know. Uh it is twelve oh nine AM. Twelve oh nine AM oh y'all <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's late here. Okay. Okay, so then that means it's ten o'clock in uh LA. So it's, it's 809 here. There you go. In right the on the money. Okay, we got you. 809. So, yeah, so we're, I'm eight hours ahead of you then. Yeah. Okay, so eight. So you said seven. Seven p.m. To, uh, your Sunday night. Got you. Okay. All right. Bless y'all, brothers. Shalom, brother. Nice to see Bless you. you. Talk with you. All right. All right. Shalom, shalom. Yes, sir. All right. Hold All it right. down in Kenya, man. Yes, sir. All right. Lila Toe.
right. All right. Good night. Or good day, I guess I should say. <laughs> okay. Um, that was an interesting call. I mean, but that, I just love getting these calls from all over the world. Right, right, and we right. get them. You know, I've, I've talked to people in about five countries today already. Mm -hmm. um, that is a blessing. Yeah. So. Uh, was, was my brother Israel right now? I'm trying to figure. I remember seeing some of his messages now, okay. you know. And. Um, I, I'll have to go back and check them out again. Yeah. All right. But anyway, we were talking about Luis de Alcazar. So you hit the, the, this partial preterist uh -huh. thing. And um, you have people out there who don't want to come all the way to be pre full preterist because that's going to put them in a bad light, if you please, with all these futurists. So they right. maintain this futurist. And they don't have but about three passages that they hold on to. Only three. <laughs> about three. <coughs> excuse me. John 14, 1 Corinthians 15, and 1 Thessalonians 4. So they claim that those are the ones that teach a future coming, but all the rest of them teach 70 AD. Right. What's Thessalonians 4? Um, you know, about... Uh, the Lord descending from heaven with the shout, oh, etc. And the dead in Christ rise first. All right. So they'll take those three passages for the most part. Uh, but they'll see Revelation is all fulfilled in 70 AD. They'll see all these other coming passages in the New Testament at 70 AD. They'll just hold out on those resurrection passages. Resurrection for the most part. Passages. Basically, that's what it is, resurrection passages. And um, but look, just to make it short, Louis de Alcazar took the book of Revelation. Mm as fulfilled in 70 AD. Just one book. One book. <laughs> one, one book. Get out of here, man. Yes. And they call him, that's where the, you know, they started using the term, you know, it's a Latin term, preterist, all right? So they start using that term relative to his position on the book of Revelation. And one of the reasons he did so was because the Catholic Church was getting a lot of flack about being the mother of harlots. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of people still believe that. They think yeah, a, yeah. the Pope and the Catholic Church is the mother of harlots, which is not in terms of of uh, that prophecy in, in Revelation. Right. So in order to take that heat off of them, he viewed the book of Revelation as having been fulfilled in 70 AD. And because of that, some people believe that he was, they just throw the name preterist around and want it to be a blanket term to refer to all preterists no you have what's called partial preterists in our opinion they are futurists because they still believe in a yet future coming and they'll tell you we're not them guys <laughs> you know we're not those guys and we'll tell you we're not those guys right, right. so even that's a contradiction because even if you believe the book of revelations was fulfilled mm -hmm. the and that still talks about his, his coming and all that. His right. It, it's a contradiction. You know, it's, yeah. it's another contradiction. So that's the difference between, I mean, that's the teaching of Louis de Alcazar. So when they bring that up to us, I mean, it's almost comical right. to bring up Louis de Alcazar and claim he was a full preterist. He was not. You are being dishonest and you are misapplying the facts concerning Louis de Alcazar to charge that he was a full preterist. He was a partial preterist. And that means that any of you who hold any coming passage to refer to 70 AD, you believe the doctrine of Louis de Alcazar. Right. Okay? You do. You do. Right. Not us. Right. And uh, so don't use that against us. I mean, we're just going to laugh. You know, and I don't mean laugh in, you know, uh, in, in, in literal sense. But, I mean, that's what we're thinking. We're saying, no, you didn't. You didn't try that, did you? Really? Um, because it doesn't, it doesn't pertain to us. Everyone who holds some of these passages to be 70 AD and then still looks forward to a future coming, you have the view of Louis de Alcazar. We do not. He was not a full preterist. He did not originate the full preterist view. Jesus did. Right. And the apostles. So that's why we get what we teach from the scriptures. And, um, and we take all passages, all of them, to be fulfilled in 70 AD. Right. The, the, see, the Catholic Church believes their eschatology is amillennialism. I know that doctrine well because that's the doctrine that I used to teach on um, the coming of the Lord. 
It's the view called amillennialism, but that is the predominant view of the Catholic Church to this day. I have Catholic books in my library in terms, and you can go online and look up the catechisms and see what their doctrine is. Um, it is the doctrine of amillennialism. I am not an amillennialist. I'm not a premillennial dispensationalist. I'm not a Zionist. I'm not a Christian Zionist. I'm not any of those things eschatologically. I am a full preterist or a person who believes in fulfilled Bible prophecy, covenant eschatology, etc., and that every jot and tittle of the law and the prophets were fulfilled in 70 AD. And if you can find that in Louis de Alcazar, then I will agree that Louis de Alcazar, and I still wouldn't agree that he started it. I would just agree that he was a full preterist, but I know he is not. Look him up on Wikipedia, read it for yourself, and then go and spread the truth about him and not try to mischaracterize us as holding his uh, doctrinal view right, right. because we don't. All right? And that should wrap it up. That's it. I yes, sir. Thank y'all for listening. Uh, All right. Everybody understand what we believe now. Okay. Yeah, some, some new, Any new closing people words? For the truth. You know what I mean? They're like uh, Ron Ben Israel and what's the other dude's name? Uh, Raymond, what's his name? Raymond Hogan. Bro. Raymond Hogan. Yeah. Hopefully, y'all can get into the truth after you heard some good scriptures tonight. That's it. And I, and I just like to add that everything that y'all, we always say, can be verified through the scriptures. So, not like we're saying anything that the Bible don't say. So, it's up to you to believe. Yeah. Jesus says all will be fulfilled in that generation. That's what he said. We didn't make that up. So, this is, this is where we're getting our, our understanding from, I mean, I, from the scriptures. You know, it, it, it to me, it takes a lot of audacity to have the Lord to say, this generation will by no means pass till all these things will feel. And then to have another person sit right there and say, well, <laughs> some of these things. <laughs> right. We well, know he, this hasn't been. He didn't been. really mean it right. like that. Yeah, right, right. You, you miss you. You misinterpret. Uh, especially the, representative. Right. Or especially when, when, the one where he says, uh, these are the days of vengeance where all things that are written must be fulfilled. It's like, okay, you can't get any more clear than that. Yeah. <laughs> like, what was it. written at the time? He, he didn't mean it, though. Yeah. He didn't mean it. It's crazy. Yeah, people just like, no, nah, he didn't mean that. Dude, that that's what it says. Like, you're, you're grown enough to understand everything that's written, man. Like, you don't right. understand. Are we looking at things beyond what is written? Like, what's going on? Yeah, hey, I didn't hear it all, man. He was talking about uh, the, the law of Moses. <laughs> right. That's just the sacrificial law he was talking about. Man. <laughs> <laughs> just that part. See, that won't work because you couldn't take away one jot or tittle till yeah. all. I know, and that's what that's another contradiction, too. Yeah. They always talk about the sacrificial laws done, done away with, but like. They don't understand what all. Let's all let's also feel that that can't even be uh, taken away. But we know that <laughs> some of you are out there listening to us, and we know that some of you are learning, and some of you are coming to acknowledge this truth. And I just want to say we appreciate you very much. We know you're going to get some flack. We're, you're going to get some pushback. You're going to get some people that want to cast you out of the synagogue, so to speak. Uh, you're going to get all of that. But, you know, this isn't about me. It's not about any of these guys. It's not about you. It's about what does the Bible say? And are you um, devoted enough to God and to truth that you're willing to accept what he says, even if it makes you or other people uncomfortable? Um, I could I could go back to teaching that Jesus is coming back and it would be very profitable for me to do so. I could go get a job at a place. There, there are churches open now that are looking for preachers. They've been telling me to apply. I haven't um, because I'm not going to go there and teach what they want me to teach in terms of, you know, I'm not going to go there and, and teach something I don't believe a and, and lie to people. I'm just not going to do it. Um, I lost a very good job when I started preaching what I'm preaching. And I've been doing it for 40 years without the help of any of them. And, um, and I haven't starved. Anybody hungry in this house tonight? No, I think I'm pretty hungry. <laughs> <laughs> pretty 
So we're we're doing okay. We're doing okay. The Lord will take care of you. That's all you got to do is you know. But but what I like for full preterist, mm -hmm. and I'll be done in my comments. We got me coming from the Hebrew Israelite background, who trust in the genealogy and all that stuff, even though it's really no proof. But you got me coming from the Hebrew Israelite background. You got you coming from the Church of Christ background. And Brother Martin over there, did he tell you, which one did you come from? From Church of Christ. Church of Christ, you've been Church of Christ your whole time too? Mm -hmm. All right, so we got Church of Christ and Hebrew Israelite, and then I know some people that came from Kojic, which is the Church of God in Christ. I know some people that came from Baptist. Uh, so Preterist is joining everybody together. And this is the only thing that I know that does it. You know, I said that years ago, over 40 years ago, I said that this will be the one view. Because, see, a lot of people don't understand this. Most of your doctrines that exist out there, if you want to talk Jehovah's Witnesses, if you want to talk Seventh-day Adventists, if you want to talk Christian Zionists, uh, even Hebrew Israelites, um, um, Mormons, you name it, pretty much, most of them split over eschatology. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was still in seminary, I drew a chart, and I still have that chart somewhere in my file. I drew a chart, and I pointed out all the different parts of eschatology that each group believed. In other words, the Jehovah Witnesses had a part over here that they wouldn't turn loose. Mm -hmm. The Pentecostals had a piece over here they wouldn't turn loose. The um, Seventh-day Adventists had a piece over here they wouldn't turn it loose. I mean, let me give you some examples. All right, the Seventh-day Adventists will say they follow the law because Matthew 5, 17 and 18, particularly verse 18, says, till heaven and earth pass away. Mm -hmm. Well, they say, look around you. We're still on the heaven and earth, so therefore the law is still in force. Right. Pentecostals say we're not going to give up the gifts because yeah. the gifts are to continue until Christ comes. Uh -huh. So there's First Corinthians 1. Right. Um, and then you have the Jehovah's Witnesses will say, well, the physical world is not going to burn up. Second Peter 3 is not about the end of the physical world, you know. And so they're not going to give that up. And uh, and so forth and so on. You, you've got the dispensationalists that will use Luke 21, 31 and say, well, you see, it says after Pentecost that the kingdom of God is yet to come. Mm -hmm. So now they're going to say the kingdom is not on earth. Yeah. All right. And uh, and then here the Hebrew Israelites will say, well, we got to go back into the land, all right, which is basically the Zionist concept as well. So all of those are eschatological themes, and everybody is split over them. Yes, sir. And they're not going to, but when they see the preterist view, it pulls all of that together. It pulls the coming of the, 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 the gifts into the coming of the Lord. It pulls the end of heaven and earth into the coming of the Lord in 70 A.D., it's going to pull the end of the law into the coming of the Lord in 70 AD. It's going to pull the gathering into Christ in 70 AD. Yeah. It's going to pull them all into one. And that's why people are coming from all different backgrounds and unifying on this doctrine because it's from God and it was about unifying people. That was the whole point of eschatology to arrive at the unity of the faith, to bring Jew and Gentile into one body, and then to bring about harmony in these things. And once you understand it, then you'll see how it just breaks all those walls down. I said that like 40 years ago, and all I've done is watched it over the past 40 years happen all over the place. Um, and this is why we got people in Ethiopia and in um, Kenya and uh, Ghana and um, uh, Nigeria and various other countries in Africa, places in Europe, Sweden, Finland, London, Paris, uh, you name it, uh, Canada, uh, all over the world, Australia, New South Wales, Brazil, you know, South America, Nicaragua, etc. All these people are seeing this truth and they're coming to it and accepting it and teaching it um, and coming together as, as one people and, and seeing that. So, you know, think about that and and uh and see see some people got doctrines that only people that look like them will accept right. you know and uh that's just not gonna work um but anyway i'm done uh, you know, i'm done i'm done I'm you done, done? <laughs> he said jesus died two sin not four sin 
What do you say about that? Okay, well, it is both are true. If you look in Rome, Romans chapter 6 and verse 10, mm -hmm. it says the death that he died, he died to sin. Okay? So it that text tells you that he died to sin. Mm -hmm. All right? Then you have Romans 4 that said he was, um, what, was what does the text say? Romans 4 is the last verse in the text, but I'm going to quote it. All right, uh, Romans 4, it says he was delivered up. He was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Now, does anybody have a King James Version? I think it actually uses the word for. Let me pull it up on the screen and see exactly what term is used in that. Yeah, Romans 4 and the verse is 25. Matthew 26 and verse 28 says, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which was shed for many for the remission of sins. All right. So it uses the word for there. And the word there is, is ace in order to the remission of sins. Um, so, so, so 25 says, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justice. So the King James Version, which some people consider to be the, the, top, version. the top version, right? It uses the word for, so it, it actually says that. So um, it's not true that he didn't die for our, he died for our sins. Wait a minute. There's another good one. All right. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and verses 2 and 3. Moreover, brethren, I declare, this is verse 1. I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you have received, and in which you stand, by which you are also saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you, first of all, how that which I also received, that Christ died for our mm -hmm. sins, according to the scriptures, I'm looking for that. <laughs> and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. So there you, have, there it. you have it. There you have it. There you have it. Yes, sir. That crack of pot. All right. Well, we put some time in tonight. Yeah, I think we we're going to let it be. Everybody, look, we appreciate you all very much. Thank you for uh, tuning in with us and listening to us. Uh, we were just hanging out here, you know, having a good time and uh, sharing a little bit of the word of God. Everybody, we'll see you next time. Look, tune in tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock Central Time. You can go right to Facebook on my page, William Bell for the All Things Fulfill radio broadcast. We will all be there in the morning having a yeah. good time. So we're gonna, we'll, we'll be on the station, to, you know, on the air together. And um, But catch that broadcast every Sunday morning from 9 until 10 Central Time. And then after that, we're headed off to the morning Bible study and worship at the, at the church. All right. So with that, have a good night. Shalom. Shalom. Peace. It's so uh she says it's, it's a nine